waiting for this for a long time. So it's good to see a lot of faces that we haven't seen uh, in a long time. And uh, so it's good to see you all. Um, we have a, a, a long, lengthy meeting, I think, tonight. So we're going to jump into the approval of the meeting minutes. You all should have received those, uh, the link in the emails. Is there any motion to accept those minutes? I'll make that motion. Brian, I'll second it. Is that Yeah, yeah. Right. Any discussion on those? Don't make me point out a typo. <laughs> there was a typo. Sync, S I N C. That's it. Any other discussion? No. All right. Uh, so, yes, will be the approved minutes. Brian, Bailey? Yes. Yeah. And uh, excuse me, but I'm going down my vote sheet, so it's not going to be in order of the table. Sorry, but it's going to be too much for me to try to look around. Okay, Brian Bailey, Michael Bancroft, yes. Uh, I am a yes. Wendy Butler, I'm going to stay. Uh, Brad is not present. Dave Fielding is not present. Mike Colson, yes. Nancy Matthews is not present. Brian McCarthy, yes. Dave Bovard, yes. Jay Sweeney, yes. Marty Van Buren, yes. Bill Pickens. And Bill Pickens was not present at that class. No, it's not. Oh, <laughs> okay. Those are approved. We are going to get into the public comment portion. Will, do you have the sheet? All right. For those of you that are new uh, in attendance, we allow up to two minutes of public comment. Uh, for those who have signed in and want to uh, to comment on something, this is not a time for back and forth between board members and you. This is the time to just state your comment. Uh, Will is going to run the timer on the screen so you can see the countdown and have plenty of time to, to wrap up as you get down to two minutes. Um, and, and I just would like to add, if I could, Mr. Chair, that we're going to give petitioners time to introduce their petitions. So don't yeah. you don't need to do that, and you won't be confined to two minutes. So that's for uh, Rob and Walter, who are on this list. So if you guys would just wait till your time to present, that'd be great. Um, I think Dave is on that list, too. Yeah. Yes. Dave is on this list? Or Dave is presenting? Yeah. Okay. okay. Okay, so he's presenting the trail cam. Yeah. Okay, let's give it up. I mean, you can make a public comment as well if you if you'd like, but I just wanted you to know you have a time to petition. Okay. Yep. Um, okay, so when uh, you're called on, if you would like to speak, uh, just please state your full name and your town of residence, and then we will start the clock. Uh, so after I think that's Walter. After Mike, uh, after Walter would be Mike Covey. Hey. Um, I'm, I'm just going to make a few statements here. You know, we hear a lot of uh, whether or not concepts are ethical or unethical. You've got petitions in front of you that are from organizations that are dedicated to uh, ending trapping. Uh, you know, they're very open about that. And um, seem to always find a way to determine that any hunting happens to be unethical. You know, we hear statements like we support trail cameras. Uh, the chair of this board actually received an email from one of the presenters tonight stating that they supported trail cameras and then they submit a petition that's in opposition to a certain type of trail cameras. Um, and, and that would be followed by the statement that somehow they're on a, um, we hear that these groups support hunting and fishing as long as it's for sustenance, as long as it's for food. Yet, just within the last couple of weeks, um, you know, rabbit hunters have been attacked for, for training. Um, there was a group of goose hunters that had a really good day and they were characterized as unethical because uh, one of the representatives of these organizations didn't like the pictures they took of the geese they shot. Now they shot within legal limits, within legal season, by legal methods, but suddenly it was unethical because there was a dislike of some of these pictures. Um, you know, we need to stick to facts, not facts. We have a great group of biologists with the Fish and Wildlife Department that can really give us uh, solid evidence and would give us solid evidence if there was a need to curtail seasons. Um, the department doesn't shy away from, from opposition to, or, or from, it's not even opposition, from creating an awareness among this board when there is a potential problem. Um, and we saw that back when there was a, you know, there was a petition to enhance the bobcat trapping season, you know, there was some concern. 
And in an abundance of caution, the department opposed it. In an abundance of caution, this board uh, didn't pass that. Um, so I just want you to, to think really critically about where these petitions are coming. Mike, uh, the other names that are on the list that have yeses are presenters. And so that will wrap up our public comment portion. Okay. Unless, is there anybody else? You might as well yeah, like to. We're not doing that. Great. Yeah. Okay, tonight, uh, so we have four petitions in front of us tonight, in front of the board. Uh, the way that we're going to do this tonight is we're going to hear from all four petitioners first. Uh, so 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes. So you each get 10 minutes to present. Uh, and after that, we will then hear from the department and we will get their response. Uh, we'll have three multiple presentations on responses to all those petitions. And then the board will discuss after uh, what action, if any, they would like to take. So that, that is the schedule of events for tonight and that's how we're gonna go about it. Uh, and I will turn it over to the commissioner to see if there's anything else the department would like to say. Before Great, no, I will, we'd, we'd like to do a brief introduction to the department's response, but we can wait for that until, uh, until after the petitioners present. Okay, so why don't I go ahead. The first petitioner is actually on the line uh, and this is for the petition to place a moratorium on fisher trapping and uh, we'll just, uh, why don't you just let us know when Lisa, I believe, is ready to go. Hey, Lisa, are you there and can you hear us? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? We can hear you actually really nicely, loud and clear. Oh, good. All right. Uh, go ahead, I Lisa. Uh, okay. Yeah, why don't you go ahead, Lisa, and we'll, we'll uh, start a clock. We'll just keep track. Okay, he won't need it in this case, but that's fine. All right. Um, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Uh, as you know, this is a petition uh, requesting a moratorium on fisher trapping. So, on February 15th of this year, Protect Our Wildlife submitted a petition to the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Board requesting that a moratorium be placed on the trapping of fisher. Our petition also asks that Vermont Fish and Wildlife provide the scientific basis that includes peer review as to why there is a trapping season on Fisher with no bag limit. Two analyses of catch per unit effort data, which is what is used to determine changes to fair fur bearer populations over the last 30 years, one by the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department and one by an independent biostatistician showed a marked and alarming decline in the Fisher population beginning in 2003. The significant discrepancy in the graph line prior to and since 2003 may also be indicative of another concern we have with the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department process, which is a shifting baseline. If that is indeed a factor, then it underscores even more vividly the advisability of hitting the pause button while the department makes some adjustments to its process so that there can be more public confidence in its data. Additionally, earlier this year, Protect Our Wildlife documented discrepancies in Vermont Fish and Wildlife's 10-year average harvest of bobcat, fisher, and other species, highlighting a concern we have with the data that Fish and Wildlife uses to inform their policy decisions. The department did acknowledge these discrepancies and corrected them in the latest fur bearer newsletter. But stepping back, I, like, I would like to ask Fish and Wildlife why there is the trapping season on Fisher in the first place. They are not a food source and fur bearer pelts are worth very little these days. I think the answer has to be that it's a recreational trapping opportunity coupled with the desire to kill predators who are viewed as competition over prey species that hunters and trappers want to kill. There is no science-based imperative to manage fisher populations via trapping, especially when the stability of their population is tenuous. Our petition also addressed pressures on the fisher population in addition to trapping, chief among which are the presence of a number of rodenticides that the department acknowledges are ubiquitous throughout the state. 
In its 2020 Fur Bearer newsletter, the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department states that due to budget constraints, it was unable to do any testing last year to determine their effect on the fisher population, but stated that testing would be done this year as, quote, there are a lot of unknowns regarding how rodenticides influence carnivore survival, end quote. There are other mortality factors, such as distemper, that are not yet well understood and need to be investigated as well. Obviously, mortality factors that are unknown and not studied cannot be controlled in the short term. But the most statistically significant one, trapping, can. It is the only form of mortality that we can control, and we should. In the last 10 years, some 3,037 fishers have been trapped or killed for little reason other than sport, a primary motivation for which is the elimination of any competition for game that hunters can take during designated hunting season. There is currently no bag limit on fisher, so unlimited fisher may be trapped and killed during the December season. This, however, does not include those fishers that are killed outside of the legal season as non-targets or those who are killed in defense of property. Fisher function as a key predator on our landscape and best available science informs us that predators should be protected, not hunted or trapped for recreation or commercial purposes. The fisher's diet consists primarily of small mammals, rodents, and the occasional porcupine. Furthermore, fishers do not overpopulate their territory. So, given that in 2019, 32 fishers were killed in just one wildlife management unit alone, we feel it is incumbent upon the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department to place a moratorium on fisher trapping until the decline in the population and all contributing factors can adequately be assessed, studied, and addressed. Given that fishers have a significant role in maintaining ecological balance and that killing them is overwhelmingly done except in rare cases simply for sport, and given that traps set for fisher also catch non-targeted species such as bobcats and the endangered pine martin, continuing this practice in the face of what seems to be a significant decline in the fisher population is simply not responsible management. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lisa. We do have a few minutes. If there are any brief questions for Lisa from board members? Thank you. I have one. Lisa, could you just clear something up for me in the petition? Who are the who are the people referenced on the consultation team? Um, there's a retired PhD ecologist, the conservation biologist. That's right. Who, who are the people right. referenced in there? There were no names given. That's all. I was just curious. Well, we can we can get all that information to you. Um, uh, uh, but um, I, in, I would like to respect that person's privacy just in case they don't feel comfortable having their name released. But uh, we, will, we will consult with them and we can get any, any information that you require to you uh, tomorrow. Okay, thanks. I think that wraps it up. Oh, Bill. Lisa, you were talking about a wildlife management area where 32 fishers were taken? Yeah. Can you tell me what area that was? Um, I don't have it in front of me right now, but once again, um, I, I can uh, reference uh, the materials we have and we can get that get that information to you. I believe it was in southern Vermont, but I'm not totally positive. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Appreciate that, and we'll, uh, the department will have their response in a little while. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, moving on, we're going to go to uh, the petition to close trapping seasons that was submitted by Walter Medwood. Walter, we'll just, if you want to stand up where you're at. Um, hey, Lisa, it's we'll Will, and he's going to turn down the volume on the phone a bit on our end, but hang on the line. You should be able to hear us just fine. 
great. Thanks so much. And Walter, if you just give uh, Will a minute to run back over there and oh, yeah. get start. <laughs> Keep it moving tonight. And, and feel free to come up, Walter, if that's yeah, better. Please, please. Yeah, either one. Yeah. <clears throat> How is this? Does this, sure. this work? That works great. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Welcome and have at it. Go ahead. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak before you tonight. Um, I uh, am here representing six other signers of the petition. Michael Haas, David Kelly, Jennifer Lovett, James White, Senator Vincent Aluzzi, Peggy Larson and, and myself. Um, on March 30th, we sent to the chair um, our 10 findings uh, and the literature that we used to support those findings. Uh, and I really won't go into uh, any review of those, assuming that you've had um, uh, ample time to go through those uh, 10 particular points. On April 8th, I did forward to the chair uh, an additional finding um, and, and some other documents. Those come out of uh, legislative hearings that took place after March 30th, and I thought that the information was, was relevant to the petitions that we have assembled. Th those um, additional documents include the VW's Vermont Wildlife Coalition's fact sheet on trapping myths um, and uh, it also included a link to a YouTube video showing two Vermont trappers interactions with a trapped <coughs> bobcat kitten just prior before before it was killed and then we we added one additional finding that again came out of the testimony and, and I'm going to read it quickly. It's finding number 11. Again, I believe you've gotten all of this information. Um, it is the position of the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department that bobcat do not need to be managed through hunting or trapping unless there are extraordinary circumstances. This position is in stark contrast to the annual seasons for bobcat uh, that the board approves for both hunting and trapping. The department's position appears to recognize the multiple ecological benefits predators bring to the landscape, coupled with the fact that unlike deer or beaver, the success of their offspring is so tightly connected to prey availability. Our 10th finding goes into this in much greater detail. The key point is that our first petition, calling for the closing of trapping seasons for predators listed, is in alignment with the department's position. Uh, and since submitting our findings, just a couple of quick updates. Macy's has ended fur sales. The governor of New Mexico just signed into law a bill that would prohibit trapping on public lands within the state of New Mexico. And just yesterday, Israel announced that it was banning the sale of most fur product. The only exception would be those used in religious um, um, ceremonies, practices. The rest of my comments are, are more general, perhaps at the 10,000 foot level. Uh, and and I, I'm hoping that it will offer some context to why the petitions have been, uh, the, petition, the two petitions that we have submitted, uh, uh, the rationale. We are in a time of great change. The wildlife profession is demanding that change occur. Perhaps no one greater than Dan Decker, who has been recognized with the highest award from the Wildlife Society, the highest award from the Wildlife Management Institute. He's published a paper with his colleagues called Wildlife Management in the 21st Century that says we must change wildlife management. The Association of Fish and Wildlife Management published a Blue Ribbon Panel Report recognizing license sales revenues dropping a wildlife crisis that we've never seen on earth before 
And perhaps their seminal statement was, state fish and wildlife agencies must transform their structures, their operations, and their cultures. Third point, the department's own staff, based on a survey done by Colorado State University, said that the majority of the staff feel the department is not doing enough to address change. And I would go on to say that there have been polls conducted by the University of Vermont Center for Rural Studies that also indicate that there is a disconnect with current public policy that you create with what, where the public is at. And, and trapping is certainly a good case where we know that the majority of Vermonters oppose recreational trapping based on that survey. And, and clearly we know that legislative leaders are looking to, to change wildlife governance. We've seen that in this past legislative session, including even a proposal, S-129, that would make this body, instead of a public policy and re regulatory body, advisory only. Chapter 10, uh, I'm sorry, Title 10, Chapter 103 of the Vermont Statutes are very clear. Why life is held in a public trust? Wildlife is a public asset by law. It is not owned by any stakeholder <coughs> group, but in, by all the public. And wildlife must be managed to reflect all of the citizens by law. The petitions before you reflect the circle of calls to modernize Vermont's wildlife governance, to bring it into the 21st century, to reflect public interest and public values so that the, 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 um, those values are reflected in the public policy that you establish. We hope the board members will look at our petitions not as a challenge, but as an opportunity to say things are changing. The drumbeat is changing um, uh, for change in how we manage wildlife. Um, and, and I would just conclude to say there is at least one point of common ground. None of us want the legislature to be involved in making decisions about wildlife. It should be done by the appropriate bodies. But if our wildlife governance is not reflective of, of the public interest in wildlife, um, that the legislature really becomes the only place where change can occur. Um, so again, as you look at our petition, the two petitions, I hope that you will at least consider the landscape of calling for change in the profession, in the association that represents the interests of state fish and wildlife agencies across the nation, department staff, the public legislators are all saying we must change the way we conduct business regarding how wildlife is managed. I thank you for your time and attention. There's a few minutes. Are there any questions? Three questions for Walter? Yeah, I have a question. Um, this, the department staff um, survey, was that, did I get that correct? Was that Colorado? Colorado State University um, published the study. Uh, it was done in 2018. Was it done for the Vermont? Um, Fish and Wildlife Department staff, or was that from another Yes, this, sorry, I wasn't clear. That was the, the staff of the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department specifically. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any questions? Um, you questions? You've said a number of times that we must change the way we manage wildlife. But you agree that wildlife needs to be managed, even predators, correct? <clears throat> I would concur with the department's position regarding bobcat, and, and by bobcat I mean all predators. I don't think there's any reason to manage predators unless there are extraordinary circumstances. Extraordinary circumstances, which again, is the department's position. So I would have no difference there. Deer, turkey, bear, 
that's a different story. Predators are, are I think, a very different um, beast. So you're saying you don't think that the, the department's responsibility uh, includes the management of predators unless under extreme circumstances? I, there's been no, there's no ecological, there's no biological rationale to, to trap or hunt bobcats. There is none, none, unless there's some extraordinary circumstance. That's the department's position and the position that we support. I think you can say that not only does that apply to bobcats, it applies to other predators that are hunted and trapped in Vermont. Again, ecologically, ecologically, there's no reason. They self-limit. Your petition is a two-part petition? Yes, sir. One is stop all trapping on predators. Yes, sir. And then a moratorium on everything else. I'm correct? That is correct. The moratorium that, that we're calling for is that you take the information that we have assembled and fully digest that to, to, to determine whether the current trapping practices are in sync with our findings and with certainly the cultural and ecological landscape. And then go forward with your trapping program, but we're simply saying reset based on the findings that we presented to you today, or March 30th. We're not saying stop, and we're simply saying establish a trapping program only after there's been a very thorough review based on our findings. Okay. On your findings? Yes, sir. Not their findings. <clears throat> I, I'm asking the board to review the findings that we've put together to see if decisions about trapping still make sense. Okay, I understand. You have the power to make public policy, and, and, and we're presenting information to you that we hope you will consider and influence your, the decisions you make about regulations and about the public policy that you will establish for all Vermonters. I'm just wondering if this is a continual circle that we're going to be going around, that you give us this information, the board decides, no, that's not what we believe, so they decline, and then we go back around and say it's circle over again. No. I, I would not support beating a dead horse. Uh, if, if the board has, in good faith, gone through the findings that we have presented, and you perhaps accept some, reject others, but then make your decisions about trapping, there would be no reason to come back and, and, and beat that horse from my perspective. But this is a one-time opportunity for me. Thanks, Walter. All right. I think that, I think that sums up pretty well. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate it. Next up. Uh, we have Rob Mullen with a petition to, to return the end of trapping season for river otters to February 28th. Well, all thank you. Great to be here in person. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, the petition is to revert the season back to what it was prior to 2016. I think this one was extended to the end of March. Um, a, a brief comment uh, regarding, I'm here for the Vermont Wildlife Coalition, and I just want to, uh, it's, it's been a sub-theme that comes up time again. We get kind of lumped in with these groups now and then. Uh, the only reason I'm still part of this group is I don't think we're one of these groups I grew up here in Vermont, deer hunting, fishing. I still have a hunting license. The only thing I really, really keen to hunt is turkey. I haven't been able to get out and do it, but uh, 
We, su we support, when we say su we support hunting, we support deer hunting, for, uh, for instance, not just for food, but it's ecological essential to hunt deer for hunting. Uh, I have a degree in bio biology from UVM, and I've stayed, even though I'm a wildlife artist professionally, I've stayed working in natural sciences with the Smithsonian Institution on a project for 15 years now. So I've stayed fairly current on my science, not like a professional scientist uh, here at the department, but uh, you know, as a pretty well-read layman. So we don't, we're going to have some cloaked agenda to get rid of hunting. We honestly support hunting. Uh, we don't support all predator hunting on a place uh, pat on it as some people are. Uh, bears, for instance, predator, but um, omnivores and can be problematic, and I think the department does a good job with them. We uh, supported their big game management plan, um, gave comments on it. I think the only thing we gave them a C was, well, was bears because of the body part sales. But it wasn't the overall management. And uh, we gave them an A on deer and, and a B on moose. So whatever. Was, they were kind of arbitrary grades. We don't have a cloak agenda. We honestly support hunting. We support fishing. Uh, we're not big fans of recreational trapping. I understand trapping has a legitimate role in research, has a re legitimate role in conservation sometimes. But uh, I'll move on. <laughs> Just kind of wanted to have that little background so you have some idea where this petition's coming from. Uh, you all have this, I'm sure, so I know you do have a long meeting, so I'm going to respect that and, and not go through the whole thing. The basic, I attended the uh, board meeting back in 2016. I don't know, I think one of Mr. Pickens was here then, but I may be wrong. But uh, anyway, I attended that and the uh, LCAR meeting subsequent to it. And at both of those, one of the main rationales for extending the, uh, the otter season to match the extended beaver season was given as animal welfare. That being that because of the trigger on, say, a conibear being offset so that a, a otter could tend to swim through or a beaver uh, would still hit it, uh, that offset would sometimes cause the trap to not misfire, but fire lake and catch the beaver, say, in the chest or the hips, and it would drown as opposed to being killed in the quick kill trap. Uh, uh, at Elkar, I pointed out, and it's in here as well, I'm not going to rehash the whole thing. The uh, AW is the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies summary of research on the best management uh, practices in tracking. Summarize the times to uh, death for various quick kill traps. And you can look at all of it, it's all in this thing. Uh, they're pretty much the overlap with drowning is it's almost complete. There's, there's marginal improvement maybe with a quick kill trap in that uh, you have five minutes to 10 minutes to drown, whereas it's up to five minutes in a quick kill. So there's, in theory, you could have a quicker kill underwater, but you're also going through water, which is 800 times as dense as air. So, so anyway, but that was pretty much dropped in the written comments, and it came back down then to uh, as bycatch during this extended season. The department testified it was about one per year. And the number that were uh, caught during nuisance beaver trapping, which was part of why the beaver trapping season was extended, was around five. And yet they're now catching 19 extra otters in 2019. So it seemed a cure worse than a disease to some degree. Uh, both those main rationales, uh, now I understand that those, those otters are usable, they're not legal otters, as opposed to bycatch otters, uh, but again, the value of pelt is not a great deal. So again, I think it's a cure worse than a disease. Uh, not a good look, in my opinion, and I just, based on the fact that those main rationales are either have been dropped in by the department in the written comments, or have been somewhat undercut by the, the number of otters that are now being taken, uh, just calls for a coming back to the original season. And with that, I'm going to wrap up uh, five minutes and 40 seconds early. Okay. Any questions for Rob? <clears throat> I remember right, the original, um, original reason why the uh, 
your agency or your group was against it was there was concern about um, hawk rearing because that was the reason why? I, I looked into that a lot, and I, I read the department's position on it, and I understand that at first glance there seems to be a real dissonance between you know what the, is on the audit cap page on the Fish and Wildlife Department's website and the rationale behind uh, the fact that so they protected otters by stopping the, because they would start breeding and start in pups in late March, so they stopped having trapping and wait for Hedler, which to any normal, you know, general layman makes a lot of sense. I understand that, and I think that's still something of an issue because while pups don't go out of the den for a couple months, and there's very little chance they're gonna get trapped in the, in the current season, the mothers do from time to time. If a mother gets trapped, the pups are doomed. And the, uh, I believe the board did away with the 10 foot rule on uh, approaching a beaver lodge, which otters use frequently. So if uh, you've got an otter mother bending in a lodge and a trap gets set in the 10 feet of the entrance and she goes out, she may well get caught. So I think it's something of an issue, but it's, it's, not the, it's not as big an issue as it seemed at first when you read that, when I read that. so. Yeah, I think that's still in there, but in interest of brevity and it's here, I, I can discuss it just now. But I do appreciate it. Any other questions for Mr. Moore? I, I got a question, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, Rob, you, you sent me uh, the Vermont Wildlife Coalition's position statement on hunting a while ago, and I, mm -hmm. I appreciate that. I appreciate its, its clarity. Uh, when I read that statement, it seems pretty clear that it's in opposition to trapping hunting of predators, all use of dogs except for bird dogs, use of game cameras and other electronics. So uh, that's a pretty big, I, I'm not uh, saying that's all hunting, but it's a big slice of, of hunting. Well, I would say deer and turkey, I'm sure I don't have to tell you, there's like 90, 95% of hunting in the state. And we are 100% in you know, vigorous support of deer and turkey hunting. Uh, I don't have a problem with uh, electronics in general. And I have a uh, hands off. I, I, I prefer to see less. I, I think skill is a good thing in the field. I, like I said, I haven't done a lot of hunting lately, but I still hunt as a, as a wildlife artist. I have to get reference. And I, I basically hunt with a camera. So I still use my hunting skills as a kid. I did all the a kid. And I use them extensively. I don't use game cameras. I get my photos in person in the field. Uh, I find you get to know the animal better that way, uh, but that's me. I'm not opposed to somebody using a game camera. The only thing I would have, and I think we, that's where the petition is, is live action game cameras. I think that's getting to a point where, you know, where do you close that door? Uh, dogs, I have zero, I have my brother who's highly trained Britneys, and you know, bird, do bird dogs uh, for waterfowl, they're great, but they're right there in control of the hunter. And you don't have, and actually, a, a skilled bear hunter. I, I, you know, I could see it, but there's so few. I mean, how many of them are just sitting in the car or the truck, uh, waiting on, you know, while they run rampant all over the countryside? And we know that's led to all sorts of problems, and it's a bad image for hunting. I think it it turns a lot of people off on all hunting to have that happen, and I think that's a tra a real wildlife management tragedy because you guys. Are hundreds are essential to, especially for deer. I mean, that's an echo, that's our, our big flagship species. Which if we didn't have hunters, we'd be in trouble. <laughs> so, uh, and this is where I, I think we really are. I admire the department. I do, and many of the people, and, and if not most, and uh, grew up that way, and I still do. Uh, I think we are after a lot of the same goals. It just you know, we do we part ways on recreational traffic <laughs> and some predator hunting. Uh, like I said, I, I, I'm not, I'm a little waffly on, on bears, so I'm gonna stay off of it. Because uh, I, I understand they can be a problem species because they're omnivorous, they're, they're a predator biologically, <laughs> but not necessarily ecologically. Uh, but uh, yeah, bobcats, as was pointed out earlier, I, I can't imagine why you have an ecological reason to hunt or a bobcat or a, or a fisher, or, or weasels for that matter. But uh, on general hunting, most hunting in Vermont, as I've said, deer, turkey, you, you couldn't get bigger boosters than us. Thanks.
Good. Thank you very much. And now we're on to our last one, and that's the cell, cell phone uh, game camera petition, and Mr. Kelly is going to present. I have a booming voice. All right. right. Mine, I'll stay right here. Yeah, works for me. Before I talk about our petition, I'm the vice chair of the Vermont Wildlife Coalition. I'd like to address some of Mr. Covey's uh, comments. Um, I grew up in Vermont. I grew up hunting in Vermont. My grandfather was the state treasurer. My dad was the deputy commissioner of agriculture. Everybody in my family has hunted. Um, I lived for six years in Montana after I got out of law school, and I worked with a licensed hunting guide in the Madison Valley. I also worked with a trapper. Uh, we trapped coyotes and beavers on the branches of the Madison Valley. So I learned something firsthand about trapping. Um, I, uh, I pretty much stopped hunting after I got out of uh, uh, law school. I um, haven't hunted a lot in, in Vermont, uh, except for a number of years when I had an English, an English setter and we, we bird hunted. I was a good friend of Steve Wright, uh, and Steve and I used to fish a lot. I'm going fishing tomorrow on the Galloway River in uh, Maine, and on July 9th, one of my old fishing buddies and I are going to fish Soda Butte in Yellowstone, and then we're going up to the Clearwater River in Idaho. So I've been a longtime hunter, a longtime fisherman, um, and uh, uh, but I'm also very, um, uh, I very much support most of the positions of the Vermont Wildlife Coalition. It is a coalition. It brings together a lot of different people and a lot of different opinions. Uh, many of us have backgrounds like mine in hunting and fishing and growing up in Vermont. And I wanna make that clear. And one of the things that we are opposed to are these live action trail cameras. Uh, I noticed in, the, in your 2021 hunting rules and guide, you write, we all have individual specialties, but whether it's tracking white-tailed bucks through miles of snow, reading the landscape to the exact square inch where a roaming bobcat will walk the next day, or seducing a reluctant long ear through the early morning fog, the thread that brings us together is appreciation of the land. And I tried to imagine the addition of this sentence, uh, uh, which says, and some of us specialize in setting up a covert WC series LTE cellular trail cam with a 32 MP instant image transmission compatible with Verizon AT&T system. That has nothing to do with any hunting tradition my family or I have ever known either here in Vermont or in Montana. If, if the, the licensed hunting guy I worked with in Montana were to have a client come to him and suggest something like this, he would have been aghast. And I've never met any of the people that came hunting to Montana who suggested that we do anything like that. It's, it's virtually unthinkable. I would imagine nobody at that table would, do, would use equipment like that. And I think that the Vermont General Assembly spoke pretty clearly for the people of the state of Vermont when they outlawed the remote discharge of firearms. This is very much along those same lines. We can see other states like Nevada and Arizona and Montana saying no to this type of unethical behavior. And I believe that if we really care about the hunting tradition, it behooves us to recognize where the lines are drawn between ethical and unethical behavior. And this is plainly not fair chase, and it's not ethical. And that's all I really have to say. <clears throat> Thank you. Are there any questions for Mr. Kelly? Uh, Mr. Kelly, you quoted uh, the Boone and Pocket Club's position on live trail cameras. Are you aware that they've changed their, their stance on those? Uh, I, I'm not aware of anything except what I quoted. Would you like to be grateful to be enlightened? I'll, as we come around to that, I'll, if you stick around, I'll, I'll, I'll read it from the Are you familiar with Justin Spring at all? With who? Justin Spring, the director of the uh, Big Game Records for our food and property. Uh, no, I'm not. I don't know. If you stick around, I'll read. I'll, I'll I've read heard, 
I'll read some of this. But are, you, are you telling me that the Boone and Project Club now supports the use of live action trail cam directly connected to a cell phone to identify game? So I'll, I'll be happy to tell you. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, that's that's fine. Fine. I just had a question. Could you just answer the question? Go ahead. Okay, so, so the, well. yeah, they actually do not ban uh, or against live action trail cams. That are connected to cell phones. That's correct. Right. Yeah, that's 100 percent yes. And I had that conversation yesterday with Justin. Uh, I am a member of the Board of Profit Club and I'm an official scorer with him. And I spoke to him yesterday by phone in regards to the Boone Profit's position on it. And they are and now and I he's actually sent me the language that they are now adopting. Mm -hmm. And I'll also go into what happened in Arizona and where their their stance is and what their stance really is, and I'll talk to the department about it as well is that, for example, in Arizona, is having problems with water tables. And it's affecting their, the congregation of game animals at specific areas. And the Department of Fish and Wildlife for Arizona had concerns that these cameras would have an impact on their ability to manage these animals. So that's what brought forth a ban on the show cameras in that state. And Boone Park does support that. And it actually has an effect on the ability to manage the game. So that's one. Then two, uh, they still believe that if a hunter's decision is made uh, based on a, a where to hunt or to take game based on the live action camera, that is their line of um, what would be ethical and not ethical. The camera itself, they don't find to be unethical or the fact that you even use one of those cameras. It's that if it makes the decision for you. And the diversity across the United States is quite diverse and some of us have had the opportunity to hunt in Colorado uh, Nevada, those types of states, and you don't have big forested areas. And being able to locate the game remotely greatly dictates where you're going to go, could protect you know, based on your moral compass. Uh, and it makes the game more susceptible versus <coughs> big woods of Maine, Vermont, um, your ability to then, you know, necess it's not necessarily going to change your outcome or not. Um, anyway, that is, the, that is the line. I will read the verbiage uh, direct when we come around to that. Uh, but I just wanted to let, let you know what their stance is and, uh, and how that applies to these other states. Again, their stance is that if any technology, it doesn't just have to be trail cameras, it could be anything, if it's having an effect on the management of game species, they would support a ban uh, by the state on it. So. Well, I, I see that I, I still have a couple of minutes. And I would, I would su submit to you that if we have a situation where a hunter sets up a live action trail camp connected to his cell phone while he's sitting in his car to identify, um, after he's already used trail cams to, to, to identify at, at what time a deer is going to get to a particular pond, he uses that as his means of tracking a deer. Again, I, I cannot imagine, un, unless I'm completely out of step, how that would be fitting with the Vermont hunting tradition. And I would be shocked if anybody at that table ever hunted with that type of technique. And I guess it goes back to GPS, it goes to the advancement of a lot of technology. Let's save some of that for, for okay. discussion. But if, if anybody has more specific <coughs> questions for Mr. Kelly and his petition, let's see. So you want to ban the trail cameras just for Deer season or seasons of hunting? Or I, don't want to I don't want to ban trail cameras. I use trail cameras. We have a lot of wildlife where I live. I, I love watching the wildlife. I love watching when the fox have kids. I love having, seeing, we have bears run through our yard. Quite frankly, we've had hounds with radio collars chase bears through our yard. And I'm not too crazy about that. But um, I use trail cameras. I, I would never use them to identify when and where to, to hunt, especially connected to my cell phone while I'm sitting waiting to shoot a deer. So you want a, just a cell phone ca camera? A live action cell phone connected deer season? Is that what you're saying? It would prim be primarily in deer season. I would leave that up to you. Um, but I think. The, the issue that needs to be considered, I, I mean, we've already said, look, you can't hunt with drones. We've already said, we're not gonna allow remote discharge of guns. 
we've, we've moved into a whole new era of technology. And when we move that technology into the tradition of hunting, we're doing something that's fundamentally changing a critical tradition. We need to think carefully about the introduction of these new technologies into our hunting tradition. And I would implore this board to consider the implications and the, the, the ethics of these new technologies. We are living through a technological revolution that's changing everything. And if we let it change our hunting tradition, I will tell you, the biggest loser will be the hunters. Because most people will look at that and say, my God, we're going to do that to deer and bears and bobcats. One more question, anyone? <clears throat> Thanks, Mr. Gelling. Appreciate that. That wraps up our presentation portion from the petitioners. Uh, let's go ahead and jump into Kim's. Yeah, I'd like Mark to give a brief a brief introduction to the to all four petitions or, or three petitions that are going to be addressed by the biological staff, and then I'll address the, the yep. uh, live action camera petition. But I, I'd like Mark to give us a brief introduction. Yep. And, uh, Thank Thanks, Commissioner. Nice to see everybody in person. And um, been a long, about a year and a half or so. And too many computer, com computer meetings we've had. But um, I, uh, I'm going to go over them real, real briefly, kind of uh, let you lay out what our presentations are going to be here um, tonight for you. But I also got to say, as, as, as someone standing before you with, with the honor of representing wildlife management in the state of Vermont and, and, and doing it for you and, and all the citizens um, here, and I've just ended my tenure as chair of the Northeast Wildlife Chiefs, representing 13 states, seven Canadian provinces, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, there as their, their leader the last two years. I, it really hits me hard to take offense in some of the comments I heard. Um, here about why our wildlife profession not advancing, not being modern, um, not coming up to speed um, to do that. And I felt I just had to say that um, to the board, representing my staff of 35 full-time people, um, 10 seasonals who work just as hard as, as the full-time people. Um, the reason we're here tonight in what you're going to see is the reaction my staff had that I had when we saw these petitions come forward and a cherry picking of comments on important studies that we have been involved with to try to help advance the movement of wildlife management, not only in Vermont, the region, but in North America. And a lot of this also is the key constituents that we rely on are getting attacked on one of these petitions and a couple of the others. Um, they help fund our conservation work in Vermont, the Northeast and North America since 1937. They are important to us um, and we do work with them for the conservation of all fish and wildlife. And I think we see the benefits when we are able to talk about fisher, bobcat, black bear, or whatever um, here in the state of Vermont to do that. Are we perfect? No, but I think we have a dedicated staff. You're gonna see that tonight um, in, in these presentations. Um, we're gonna, uh, one of them just review was the closed trapping season. In one aspect of the petition, asked for the closing harvest of red and gray fox, bobcat, fisher, weasel, coyote, and otter. Um, for the record, I think we have at least two weasel homes that are, that are here found in, in the state of Vermont. Um, another petition on is that moratorium should be placed on the trapping of Fisher. Um, we want to return, the, one other petition calls for the return to the end of the trapping season for rib, river otters to February 28th. And then the fourth petition um, that you just heard from the last petitioner was to forbid the use of live action trail cams for locating and identifying for the purpose of taking wildlife during uh, hunting season. The first three, um, our wildlife staff has been working on since March, actually February, when these came up. We took it serious. There's a lot of elements that you read into what the petitioners just presented to you, not so much verbally here tonight, some of it came out, but when you go down through what they sent you in writing to do that, um, our staff took that serious. They spent the last three to four months, and I'm saying staff, I'm talking about several people, um, within the wildlife division. Um, a lot of people on our fur bear team, um, you're gonna see uh, Kim Royer that you all know um, before. She's been with the department for about four decades. Um, she not only has been our fur bear project leader, one of our chief leaders in wildlife habitat throughout the state of Vermont, and is right now is our interim uh, species program manager, filling in until we're able to fill that uh, position right now. 
Um, we also, you're gonna hear from tonight, uh, Dr. Katie Geeter, who's been with us for almost four years. She is our key biometrician and research manager um, for the state of Vermont. Um, the Fur Bear team, um, I just wanna note those folks because they spent an awful lot of work on, and you're gonna see it tonight, and you're just gonna see part of it. Um, we're also trying to work on some written text that will have you some documentations for you and the rest of Vermonters to see as questions come forward of why didn't you do this, why didn't you do that, and you're gonna notice the tremendous amount of scientific research that went into the presentations. You're just gonna get some snapshots of it tonight um, in the PowerPoint. I'll get that all to the board. Um, as soon as we finish it, it'll be up on our department website and available for, for people in Vermont um, to see as well. But um, just let me make a note um, on the, the Fur Bear team. I think our um, Lieutenant Sean Fowler, you're here, yeah, he's on the team, he's been on it quite a lot of time. It's been a lot of work with, with our team on, the, on this position. Um, Chris Bernier, Chris, thanks for coming here tonight. I think you know Chris from the other day on the computer working with you on the turkey project. As you see, our staff wears lots of different hats. Um, also, you're gonna see Dr. Katie Geer in a minute, um, Chris Saunders, Nicole Meyer who hums up, hum, heads up our Hunter Education uh, Program. And I also wanna note, especially to uh, Mary Beth Adler, who's been a long-term seasonal for us, and, and maybe Kim remembers, I don't know, it's 20 years, 30, it's probably how it does. A tremendous worker um, for the department. So, so Kim is gonna lead us through on first addressing the tracking petition um, with a PowerPoint on that. And then we're going to perhaps, potentially it's your call what you wanna do, Mr. Chair, but we might recommend at that point to stop, ask us questions on it, and then take that issue up on the board of what you wanna do. Either, you know, um, deny it, table it, have us come back with more information if you please, or accept it. If you accept it, then we'll move forward trying to provide you more information um, to, to on, your, on your deliberation there. Then the otter petition, Kim's gonna lead us through that. And then the Fisher petition, um, both Kim and, and Dr. Dieter are gonna be teaming that. And the last petition that we wanna address will be the game camera one. And uh, our commissioner is gonna lead the discussion on, on that one with you. Um, we didn't get into, the, we, into that as a biological staff, because at this point we have no information that game cameras, cell game cameras, any other technology hunters are doing is affecting our ability to manage wildlife in the state of Vermont. So, so it, it's really, it's a whole different type of issue and I think it's appropriate for the commission. So that's our game plan. Um, I think, Will, you said what, pizza's coming around seven, we'll take a break for? 6.30. 6.30, okay, so whenever it's kind of convenient, Kim, I'll let you kind of use your judgment and when, when to go great time to do that. I also want to recognize, um, maybe you want to have the other department staff commissioner? Yeah. introduce themselves too because uh, a lot of this work it's not just the wildlife division uh, that works on managing wildlife there's also what 35 full-time wardens uh, so our director of warden services if you want to introduce your staff name jason hi everyone jason batchelder director of warden service we have lieutenant fowler who's a northeast district chief and warden Dustin cersei who's out of moortown um, thanks for being here tonight guys thank you mark and of course will Dwayne and Catherine guessing and uh forrest hammond Forrest, as you know, is our Black Bear Project Leader. Um, we may say a few words, Commissioner May, later on that, but Forrest is also involved with us on all these other issues, too. So it really is a team team game here when we start talking about wildlife management. And if, I might suggest I'm going to move into the, the yeah. seats. Please do. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Yeah. And Jim That's, can you guys see that all right? Do, it's great. do I need a microphone? Dark on Kim? It's not dark on me, I'm good. Okay, great. Well, thanks everybody. And um, I think this presentation is gonna be a little bit different than the presentations you're used to hearing from biological staff. Uh, because if you went through the petition, you realize that it's more about values than it is about wildlife populations and biology. So I'm going to actually give you, start with history, which is going to give you some context, which I'm sure a lot of you already know. And then I'll get in and address each one of those findings one by one, point by point. So we start about the time that Jesus walked the streets of, of uh, Nazareth. And we had a Native American culture here. Don't worry, I'll shorten it up a little bit. Time will go fast. Uh, we, we had a, a Native American culture here that was by necessity, they lived lightly off the land. Uh, they were basically hunters and gatherers. They relied heavily on fur uh, for clothing and, and wildlife for food. 
and, and beaver for food and clothing. And uh, they lived that way until the Europeans arrived on this continent. And you can imagine um, the Europeans came looking for natural resources. And it would be hard to overstate the role that this search for natural resources had on the exploration of this country. And they came with, uh, you had people who were in the Stone Age, basically. And these folks came with metals, metal, metal pots, with linens, with knives, with guns. And they said, we'll trade you any of these things for beaver, for fur. Um, and of course, it seemed like a great deal to the folks at that time. Of course, we know what came with those Europeans was lots of disease, which essentially decimated those populations and the culture that um, really kept, really supported those populations. And so we basically, prior to European settlement, may have had as many as 200 million beaver before the Europeans got here. Uh, but by the end of the 1670s, nearly a quarter of a million beaver had been taken out of the Connecticut River Valley alone, according to shipping records. Um, and by the time uh, Vermont was settled, beaver had probably been very, 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 almost extirpated from the state for maybe 70 years. So um, Vermont was settled a little bit differently than Southern Vermont. As most of you know, you've seen the stone walls out on the landscape. Uh, people came up from Southern New England uh, they came in family groups, they carved out subsistence farms on the landscape, and started clearing the forest. In 1760, we had as few as 3,000 people of European descent here. By 1790, 85,000, and by 1800, 155,000 people. So this is called the surge. This is when Vermont really drastically changed. These people were all bringing up livestock, trying to eke out a living, clearing the land, and we all know the story of Vermont. By about 1830 or 40, we had cleared, we'd gone from about 95% forest to about 35% forest. And this had a drastic effect on the wildlife that lived here. And you can see just from this graph, Vermont is the red line right there. We, we were cleared a little bit later, but, um, but still a drastic change in the habitat that was here. They also came, with, like I said, with livestock. And um, they had to protect those livestock in order to protect their living. And so there were bounties on most predators at that time, everything from wolves to mountain lions to lynx to bobcat to fox. And this is just a map of the bounty records from 1777 to 1781 on wolves. The blue dots are actually mountain lions. So that period of time, most of you are very aware of this, that whole period of the 1800s. We lost many of our most iconic wildlife species as a result of that drastic habitat change and the unreg unregulated taking of wildlife. There were no laws, no seasons, nobody overseeing the take, and many of these species disappeared, or at least their numbers decreased drastically. So in response to that, the legislature in 1876 established a Fish and Game Commission. They had a Fish, fish Commission first, and they expanded it to Fish and Game Commission. Um, and then the current department structure actually was established in 1906 with the first hunting and fishing license in 1908 for 50 cents. Quite a deal back then. Um, and the legislature actually established uh, the, the mission of the department. It, it provided the underpinnings for the rest of, of what we did, and it basically was that the Commissioner of Fish and Wildlife shall manage and regulate the fish and wildlife of Vermont in accordance with the requirements of this part and the rules of the Fish and Wildlife Board. This is where our authority, yours and our authority, comes from. The state, through the Commissioner of Fish and Wildlife, shall safeguard the fish, wildlife, and fur-bearing animals of the state for the people of the state, and the state shall fulfill this duty with a constant and continual vigil vigilance. We take that pretty seriously, and I know you guys do too. Then following that, the Congress actually established uh, a tax uh, with, it, with the support of the sportsman's community on uh, guns and ammo and archery in 1937. This is what's funded many of the restoration efforts that have occurred since then. And of course, in 1950, um, they followed with a tax on, on fisheries equipment. Uh, which has helped to support much of the fisheries conservation work that's gone on. Today, our, our budget, about 60% of our budget, upwards of 60% of our budget, is actually comprised of, of uh, dollars that have come from sportsmen 
uh, related activities still. So like I said, these were the funds that established, reestablished re, re many of these populations that had been extirpated um, or had declined as a result of those changes in the 1800s. So 1878, I think it was a precursor to the Vermont Federation of Sportsmen that actually brought some white-tailed deer back into the state. I'm sure many of them came in on their own as well. Um, in the 1950s and 60s, the Forest and Parks Department, in cooperation with the Fish and Wildlife Department, uh, brought in Fisher from, from Maine and New York and released them in uh, all over Vermont. And that's been a huge success story. 69, uh, turkeys were reintroduced and, and actually the department participated or led a trap and uh, transfer program for turkeys up until the 1990s uh, within my career. If you can believe it, I, I'll never say never, 1956 uh, residential, we didn't have a residential goose population and um, my professor from UVM actually pinioned geese in, um, in Addison and uh, look what happened. So. And then in 89, 90, and 91, uh, we actually were involved in bringing the American Martin back into the state. Um, in the southern, we partnered with the US uh, Forest Service and uh, released about 108 animals, I think it was, into the southern greens. And we thought that had failed, and mostly because we had had some of the warmest weather, warmest decade on record. But um, actually, while I was not fur bearer biologist for a period of time, Chris actually uh, started a monitoring program with Connecticut State University. And um, we have a core population down there, which is exciting. Other fish and wildlife restoration efforts are ongoing. Moose, lake sturgeon, beaver, peregrine falcon, lynx, eagle, walleye. And, and that's just to name a few. I mean, that's basically what we do, is manage and restore wildlife populations. That's what drives us. That's what we're committed to. So to circle back to the, um, the petition, the petitioners, and I think maybe even Walter mentioned this, or maybe it was Rob, uh, mentioned the, the survey that was done by the Center for Rural Studies. And yes, there was a, there was a survey question um, that I think it was POW um, paid the Center for Rural Studies to, to uh, ask, and it was about trapping. Um, I think it, to me it was, it, it seemed to be worded in such a way that sort of led uh, the replier to, to a certain type of response. Uh, and, and they call it the most definitive and independent survey that's been done on trapping. Um, I would beg to disagree given that there's surveys that have gone on across the country on trapping, including Vermont. We did one uh, as part of a communications survey in 2015. We found 56% of Vermonters actually support regulated trapping, 27% oppose. In Maine, they did a much more comprehensive survey, and they had 75% support for trapping, 17 regulated trapping, 17% oppose. Connecticut, 61%, Indiana, 75%, and Wisconsin, 77%. So uh, I think it's disingenuous to suggest that one question from one survey um, is the most definitive response on how the public feels about trapping, because it's a nuanced topic and it's complex. So finding one, um, the petitioners contend that the current public policy on trapping con contradicts the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agency's Blue Ribbon Panel results. Um, now, we have read the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agency's Blue Ribbon Panel. We actually support the findings of the Association of Fish and Wildlife agencies recommendations and and their recommendations are basically we need to broaden the tent in order to address the 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 threats to wildlife going forward we need to have everybody care about what's happening with our wildlife populations and the habitat that supports them and we that's exactly what we want to do that's exactly what we have been doing in fact way before AFWA came out with its blue ribbon panel this department, and I'm sure many other departments across the country, have partnered with a whole host of organizations to address the, these threats. And, and Vermont has partnered with everybody from the US Forest Service and the US Fish and Wildlife Service and Vermont Audubon and the Nature Conservancy and Vermont Coverts and the Vermont Woodland Owners Association and on and on and on to try to motivate and move uh, the, these issues forward. 
just the development of the Wildlife Action Plan alone, we had 60 to 72 different partners participate in the development of that plan in 2005 and 2015. So there's been a lot of input on the part of partners and the general public on the work that we do. You as a board know that every time we make a, a rule change, almost every time, I won't say every time, we go out for public comment and we collect those comments, we take them seriously. Doesn't mean that we're going to make changes based just on those comments. Our mission is the conservation of fish, wildlife, plants, and the habitats they depend on. That's, that's the basis for how we make our recommendations and how we make these rule changes and these, these um, it's, so we're not, it's, not a, it's not a popularity contest. It's not like, oh, we get this many votes on this, so we're gonna move in this direction. It's about what's in the best interest of the resource and people's connection to that resource. The, the, the um, petitioners talk about equity and you know equity is important. We, we agree that we need to be including everybody in these conversations, but that doesn't mean that we are trying to narrow the tent. We, we, the AFWA's point is that we're trying to expand the tent, not narrow the tent. And by banning a whole group of people from doing an activity that's ecologically appropriate, including indigenous people, we're actually narrowing the tent. We're doing exactly the contrary thing to what AFWA is, is recommending. We can still support these folks who have spent generations living lightly off the land and still expand the tent. There's, there's, it's, not, it's not a counterproductive activity. We can do both. And they have no bearing, these regulated activities have no bearing on the ability of the other folks who don't hunt and trap, who, who I respect. They don't have to hunt and trap. But these activities have no bearing on their ability to see and enjoy these wildlife populations in any way that they want to. So there's also, uh, the petitioners also say that, um, that, that our, the, the information around trapping or our position on trapping um, was not codified with all people at the table. And, and I think we believe that actually our position on trapping was codified in 1793 when the Constitution was written. And it doesn't specifically state trapping, but hunt back then, when you were hunting for something, uh, you might have used um, any different device, a muzzleloader, a bow, um, a deadfall, or some type, type of trap. Uh, so we believe that the Constitution actually covers trapping as well. And um, we recognize that today, people are, more concerned, as are we, about animal welfare, fair chase, respect, sustainability. These are all things that we've been working on for the last 20 or 25 years to try to address through our hunter education classes, our, um, our work on the BMPs, which I'll get into a little bit more later. Uh, so yes, we, we, need to, we need to rework the way we do things, but that doesn't mean you throw the baby out with the bathwater. The petitioners, um, this is finding two. The petitioners in this finding claim that, and I think um, maybe Walter mentioned this in his, in his discussion, um, that the petitioners claim that Vermont's current practices are at odds with the thinking of prominent leaders in the wildlife profession and violate the principles of the public trust and good governors as espoused in Decker et al. Uh, this is kind of interesting because I read that paper, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago, whenever it first came out. And um, we actually invited Dr. John Organ, who's a co-author on that paper, to come to our management team, an expanded management team retreat that we had, and actually go through those governance principles with our management team to kick off our own relevancy efforts, which was before AFWA even did theirs. Um, and I called Dr. Organ because I thought, is this a correct interpretation of those governance principles? They seem, that's not what we heard when he came to speak to us. And he, he basically sent me about a, a back a quote that said, I disagree with the above statement. The governance principles we put forth state that wildlife governance will produce multiple sustainable benefits, will allocate benefits from the trust and other principles. We are the, we're the ones responsible for managing and allocating these resources. 
that clearly provides space for people who track. It is the trust administrator's responsibility, again us, to ensure such allocations are sustainable, and I'm not aware that any science that suggests otherwise in Vermont. So a co-author of that Decker paper still suggests that trapping and hunting are part of the work that we all do. So then the petitioners suggested in that same, same finding that um, there's no evidence that diverse perspectives inform current practices, nor do the practices reflect the wildlife values held by most Americans or their interests in the out of doors. Well, the department does their own public surveys quite frequently. Um, and you can see from this one, we ask about the <coughs> things that we, um, we do and whether or not the public supports the things that we do and, and supports us as a government agency. This question, do you agree or disagree that the department effectively balances the interests of anglers, hunters, conservation groups, and the general public? 76% of residents um, agreed that the department balances these interests. And this is up, we did the same survey or asked the same question, I guess, in 2003, it's up from 67%. Um, 7% disagreed, but that's down from 11% um, in 2003. So at least up until 2015, uh, we, we were making progress in terms of how the public looked at this department. Again, another question from that same survey. Um, overall, are you satisfied or dissatisfied with the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department as a government agency, or do you not know? Again, 76% support of the department as a government agency, up from 57% in 2003. And only 3% were dissatisfied, um, down from 10%. And even, I think, which is better for us, and something we're even more excited about, is that fewer people don't even know who we are. Because we want those are the people we want to connect with the out of doors. And the, um, Dr. Duda, who, who actually um, oversaw this survey, said to us in a meeting afterwards that given that government is generally so negatively viewed, the response to this survey is even more impressive. Lastly, um, we asked in 2013, but I don't think we, uh, we, we repeated this at any point, um, the percent of respondents who indicated that each of the following sources would be very credible source of information on fish and wildlife and outdoor recreation. The top two sources, a biologist with the Fish and Wildlife Department and a warden from the Fish and Wildlife Department. Um, so apparently we still, we still had some credibility back then. Uh, finding three, and finding three is a little dense. I'm gonna just uh, refer back to the petition specifically. Basically, the petitioners say their concerns about current public policy on trapping as established by the Fish and Wildlife Board are buttressed by key points drawn from AFWA's annotated bibliography. And, and I, I didn't try to address all those points because we agree with most of them. These points are things like wildlife professionals generally agree that public values towards wildlife changed dramatically over the latter half of the 21st century. We have seen this coming for probably 20 years and we've been working on try to de trying to deal with these changes. Um, there has been a gradual shift away from traditional values that emphasize the use and management of wildlife for human benefit towards a more pro protection-oriented approach to wildlife. Now, many researchers actually attribute that to the urbanization and suburbanization, which um, they claim unlocks sort of the anthropogenic tendencies, anthropomorphic tendencies, part, pardon me, um, and really the role, as I saw it, of the whole AFWA effort was um, to help state fish and wildlife agencies navigate these changing, this changing culture, recognizing that we're going to be dealing with a whole lot more polarization in the public than we've had to deal with to date. Um, and one of the key messages out of the Blue Ribbon panel is although core constituencies like hunters and anglers will continue to be key allies, there's a need to broaden stakeholder representation to ensure fish and wildlife conservation remains relevant and supported by people from all walks of life. Yeah, sounds great. Who's to disagree? Uh, while I was talking to Dr. Organ, uh, oh, actually I think this came out of a, 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 a paper he did 
He said, it is unfortunate that advocacy groups are transmogrifying principles developed by wildlife professionals designed to advance our profession in order to challenge accepted and legitimate wildlife management practices. Um, it is unfortunate because we need everybody to work towards addressing the real threats that are out there. The petitioners go on to suggest that wildlife management's been captured by consumptive interest groups. And um, we've basically been providing access and opportunities to the general public long before the AFWA Blue Ribbon Panel. And I'm just going to go quickly down through some of the things that we've done over the last 30 and 40 years to, to actually address uh, wildlife protection for the entire public of Vermont. We are, we've been a leader in landscape conservation design. Probably most of you have heard about this. This is the Vermont conservation design map. Uh, we actually started with a black bear range map in 1991, where we mapped critical habitats for black bear, large forest blocks, and connected corridors. Um, and that sort of jump-started this whole effort to look at our landscape from the big picture. And how do we connect Vermont up to New York, to, to Canada, uh, to New Hampshire? And so, you know, we've, we've, we've involved probably 20 to 25 partners in this effort over an, maybe a four-year period and have created a lot of outreach materials for, for towns and regional planning commissions as well. Uh, we've had a person that's specifically appointed to actually work with town and regional planning commissions to try to incorporate wildlife protection language into their town and regional plans, and we developed those two books uh, that can be used by town and regional planning commissions to actually pull language right from those books in order to incorporate into their town plan. And we've worked with Vermont Natural Resources Council to actually assess what kind of difference we've made over the last um, 10 or 20 years. Most of you know that we've done a lot of work with Act 250, the protection of what's called in the bill necessary wildlife habitat, but suffice it to say, it, it's basically critical habitat for deer, wintering areas, which provide habitat for a whole host of other species. Uh, black bear habitat, mostly bear scarred beach stands or oak stands, wetland habitats, and um, you notice the yellow bars are rare, threatened, and endangered species. We've actually seen an increase in the protection of habitat for rare, threatened, and endangered species in the last 10 years. Land conservation acquisition, maybe you heard that we actually purchased our um, 100th wildlife management area in 100 years uh, down in Shrewsbury. We have 135,000 acres of, of WMA lands, which are open to the public for wildlife-based <coughs> recreation, any public for wildlife-based recreation. And um, we've recently been more involved in an effort to protect and to purchase wetland habitats through an EPA grant. And we've purchased about 2,400 acres of wetlands that can be restored. Uh, we, we manage all these lands for wildlife. Uh, we have a visitor center at Dead Creek. Um, we have roads for access and um, we've done about a thousand acres of manage management. I think, was that this year, do you know, Mark? Or was no, that sir. just one year? No. Yeah. Um, we have a private lands technical assistance program. We have three and a half staff members who actually go out and work with private landowners to manage their property for wildlife, to benefit wildlife. We, over the last year, conducted 577 site visits and um, had 22 different workshops. We partner with all those groups and more that are listed down at the bottom to develop those workshops, and, um, and it's, it's just an amazing program. And then we have the Wildlife Diversity Program, and I, I I didn't want to go into depth, it's just that we have a whole program of people that spend time monitoring, managing um, all of the rest of the native um, wildlife plants and natural communities uh, that are not hunted and trapped. So as a result of our relevancy efforts, um, we actually have stepped up uh, tr access to the out of doors and stepped up our outreach to to people other than our traditional users. We actually have WMA tours for anybody who wants to come, the general public. We have birding tours. Um, we have actually started outreach to new Americans in the Burlington area and to the indigenous tribal members um, to try to sort of 
figure out how we can work together and create synergy to move wildlife forward for, for those folks. We do public presentations uh, pre-COVID, probably I did maybe two or three a month, um, and on all different kinds of topics. Every single biologist does presentations all year long. Uh, we, train, we, we train landowners at coverage trainings twice a year. Uh, we have a teacher's course. We actually host a teacher's course where we train teachers on wildlife issues. And um, we actually, as most, as all of you know, we have the two camps where we have many youngsters come and learn. So basically our wildlife division breakdown of activities, of, of upwards of 70% of the wildlife division's time is spent on habitat, management, protection, conservation, and wildlife diversity. And it's, it's actually even a little more than that because in the species management program, Chris and I also um, manage the endangered Martin and, and lynx. So, um, so there's a lot of effort going into programs and projects that affect all Vermonters. And so to suggest that we are captured by the, the, just the sportsman's group is, to, is, is naive at best. And at worst, it's actually an intentional effort to undermine the department's credibility. And, and that saddens me very much, just, just as Mark said. So are we going to keep working with hunters and trappers? Of course we are, because of the years of effort and, and funding and, and work that they've done for conservation. Um, are we going to continue to partner with our conservation partners? Of course we are, because they also contribute to the conservation of, of wildlife. And I think this is what it's, it's all about. Wildlife managers must avoid the temptation to use only the preferences of a limited group of stakeholders as the basis for decisions. We couldn't agree more. I think it's somewhat ironic that a small group of stakeholders, i.e. the petitioners, are suggesting that we only listen to them and ban a whole group of people that have been participating for generations in an ecologically appropriate activity. Finding four, I'm not going to get into too much detail here. There, finding four is that trapping is at odds with the North American model of wildlife conservation. I couldn't disagree more. Um, you know, again, I hate, hate to keep referring back to Dr. Oregon, but he was a co-author on this technical review. Um, and I, there's no evidence that anybody thinks that hunting and trapping are not part of the public trust resource. I think what's important for wildlife professionals is that we manage that resource so that it's available to all people. And that is how the Fur Bearer Project manages our fur bearers. The impact from trapping on our fur bearer population does not change its ecological role at all. It doesn't change the natural processes and it doesn't affect the ability of anybody else who wants to view or appreciate those animals to do so. I will say also that over in Europe where they have banned the trapping of, of animals, they trap for, um, for human conflict, they trap probably hundreds of thousands of fox, millions of, of muskrat, all that get wasted. That is contrary to the public trust. Finding five, public pushback against trapping. Um, oh, wait, you know what? Maybe I should ask Will. Uh, As the pizza for, here? For, uh, keep, keep going. Keep going? All right. Okay, well, can please. I do another one, Will? Another okay. finding? Please. Take okay, it. let me know. I'm, I'm happy to stop at some point. I'll leave that to your discretion. Okay. It's, it's here? Is it here? I'll do, okay. do one more. I'll do one more. Yeah. You're I think on a this, good roll here. Okay. No, I you got me at the edge of my seat, Kim, so keep going. <laughs> <laughs> okay, finding five is public pushback against trapping in other states. Again, I think Walter might have mentioned this. Um, other states and jurisdiction. They claim that that justifies that we actually ban it in Vermont. And I think what's really interesting, that, that survey that was done by Manfredo in Colorado, which um, was also referred to by the petitioners, they actually asked a question um, of both hunters and non-hunters, uh, the things that actually threaten wildlife going forward. So they asked the question, uh, what's more important to you, protection of wildlife or economic growth? Notice how similar the responses are between both groups. Uh, do you value private property rights over the protection of wildlife habitat? Again, 
Very, very common results. There's only a few percentages different between the two groups. Climate change, do you think climate change is um, a threat? Again, almost the same. So why would we want to polarize people around these issues that we think are so important to the future of wildlife when we need everybody to work together to address these things? It doesn't make sense to create polarization where we don't have to. Again, this is, a part, this is from Manfredo. Uh, I think this one's pretty interesting. Manfredo basically, this is the Colorado survey. He, he broke people into values groups. Traditionalist is somebody who believes that wildlife should, can be harvested for food and clothing. Mutualists believe that we should live in harmony with wildlife. Pluralist believes that they, they basically have, they change their values based on the specific situation. And distanced are the people that really don't care too much or have much connection to wildlife. These are the people we want to get, the distanced people. We want to get them involved in wildlife. We want to have them feel like protection of wildlife and habitat's important. What's interesting is when they ask the question about support for the Fish and Wildlife Department in particular, it was almost, it was, every single group was above, is that 70 or 80? Anyway, I mean, all of those different, different values groups all think that what we're doing is important for them and for their lives. So, you know, what can I say? I'll end it there while we can have lunch or breakfast, dinner, okay? Sure. <laughs> yeah, let's take a 20 minute break or so and I'll reconvene the meeting and I don't, Will. I don't know if there's enough to share, but typically we do. So if, if those in attendance want to uh, grab some pizza, go ahead. Yeah, Mark says there will be, so have at it. Come back. Here we go, finding six. Four or five more to go. So um, finding six. I think the petitioners take the position that trapping is not highly regulated. There's actually 42 different laws um, that govern the harvest and, and sale of fur bearers. Uh, and that doesn't include the laws around the seasons. Um, I know there's always been concerns about bag limits, but we actually look at average catch per successful trapper. And those are always quite low. I'd say for otter, it's probably two at this point. I forget Fisher three to five or something, five at the peak and three now or something. I can't remember exactly. Um, so if we thought that that was a problem, we would change it. But at this point, we haven't felt like that has impacted the population. Um, we have the longest running biological database, I think, in the region, if not the country. Um, and we collect mandatory collection of, of fisher, otter, and bobcat carcasses. We've collected catch per unit of effort data since 87. We have mandatory fur dealer reports. We are doing camera surveys to detect rare and threatened species, lynx and marten in particular. And we've actually done a, vet, a survey for the veterinarians in the state. We've done it twice. I think it was probably 20 years apart. Um, and they, it was a remarkably similar from 20 years ago to the one we did, I think it was 2018, where we have an average, we'd like to get this to zero. We have an average of six animals taken to the vet for treatment that have been caught in traps, but that's in 314,000 trap nights. Um, so it's a very, very low number. Again, if we could get it to zero, that would be great. Um, animal welfare, uh, this is, this. I could do a whole presentation on animal welfare. Um, the development of best management practices, there's uh, Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies has been working on the development of best management practices for at least 20 years, if not longer. Uh, they actually adopted testing standards that came from three different countries who developed those standards together, Canada, Russia, and the EU, the European Union. Um, they're the highest animal welfare standards for any harvested animal um, in accordance with the International Association for Standardization. So there's an international association that, that we're meeting the welfare standards for They've tested over 600 commercial trapping systems on 23 different fur bearers, and, and we hired over across the country 1,000 trappers, wildlife technicians, and state agency biologists. We followed strict protocols. This is a research effort. It was science-based. Um, we actually had veterinarians do 
blind post-mortem examinations on over 5,000, 8,000 of these animals, 8,500 of these animals. In, in, in part of this research effort, in 230,000 trap nights over 21 years, no threatened or endangered species was ever captured as part of this. And they were, they were using the same traps the trappers use right now, only modified to some degree, and using the same systems. Um, and still, no threatened or endangered species were captured. No domestic animals were captured 99.95% .95 of the time, except for two cats. Those that were captured were released unharmed. Now that's pretty significant over a 20 year period. In, in, in addition to that, the Association of Veterinary Medicine actually refers to the AFWA BMP website um, and endorses the research effort that's going on there. Um, so these, uh, just so you guys know, and, and I can go into this at some point in the future, not tonight, but these were the types of documents that were developed. There's actually a BMP document for almost every species in the region. There's Fisher, every species that's trapped in the region. And it outlines for trappers what type of trapping systems they might use to pass the, to, for the BMPs. And the department was actually involved in this effort for 10 years, uh, upwards of 10 years. We actually had people on the ground. We hired trappers and field observers to work on this effort. And since that time, we've been promoting it at every chance that we get. We put it in our newsletter almost every year. Uh, we go to the rendezvous and talk about it. Uh, we, pre we present it in our trapper education classes. Um, and, and actually, uh, a survey that was done, a national survey that was done uh, in recent years actually found that Vermont trappers, 74% of them know and or have um, in, incorporated BMP systems into their uh, trapping programs. What's interesting is that it's not really designed to be a regulatory uh, process because we, trappers need flexibility to apply certain types of trapping systems in certain types of territory, uh, certain types of landscape. And so there is flexibility involved in, in the whole process, um, which makes it really difficult to enforce. So we've been working really hard to try to get them adopted just on a voluntary basis. There's a question on the petitioner's part about whether trapping is an important tool for conservation. Um, this is pretty hard to dispute. Uh, we've actually hired trappers to recover the American Martin that we introduced into the Southern Greens. We hired trappers in Maine and trappers in New York. We could not have done that reintroduction without the help of, of avocational trappers. We use trappers in Vermont in particular on the protection of endangered spiny softshell turtle. There, we hire them to, to uh, try to uh, trap things like raccoon, uh, skunk, foxes that are impacting the nesting turtles on the shoreline of, of uh, Lake Champlain. We've used trappers in two research efforts that we've had, one on bobcats where we radio collared bobcats, another on coyotes back in the 1980s. And we had help from avocational trappers who helped us actually either trap these animals or helped us design the systems that we were gonna use. And I, I think we would have not had the success that we had without the expertise of those people. Human wildlife conflicts, I'll get into a little bit more later, but yes, um, you know, it is an important local tool for dealing with specific human wildlife conflicts. And as I think I mentioned, we, we collect these carcasses and collect information that allows us to monitor for these populations and, and actually get information that we can't get in any other way. Uh, the petitioners question the role of trapping in mitigating density-dependent diseases. And I think in this case, mitigating is the operative word. Uh, we would not suggest that at the trapping, the levels we're trapping today, that we would have any kind of population impact on disease because we're just, we're just not taking that many animals. However, um, trapping can play a role in lowering densities in localized populations. And it has, has done that in places in Canada. I think more importantly from our perspective is that um, we are able to monitor for different diseases because we collect these carcasses. And we've done canine distemper testing on um, I think 70 Fisher, Fisher. Uh, a couple of years ago. We found one positive response in Vermont, which was, which was a positive thing from our perspective. We partnered with a Tufts student. Um, and she was collecting liver samples for rodenticide testing. We did that about two or three years ago. I think maybe one of the petitioners rec uh, suggested this. 
We actually have followed up on that. We, did, we sent another 30 samples this year and we hope to send another 30 in the next fiscal year. And we're, we're trying to participate in a regional rodenticide effort. There's other states that are really interested in this, New York, Pennsylvania, Maine. And so everybody's trying to send their samples to the same lab um, so that we can get a regional look at what's, what's going on with rodenticides. We've partnered with the University of Vermont and, and several other researchers to look at genetics of our, our population. Um, we have uh, folks from Wildlife Services come to almost every session and um, collect information on rabies. So these carcasses are really provide a lot of information on just the health of these populations. Um, so really important. Trapping is an important tool to reduce human wildlife conflicts. This is a case where I do think the petitioners cherry picked out of, they, they actually refer to white at all, white 2020 at all, which is a, a relatively new document on best management practices. And my guess is I went through the, I went through it to try to find out how they could refer this to white. And I found this one statement um, which says, hence broad generalizations about the effectiveness of avocational trapping at reducing human wild, wildlife conflicts are unwise. I would agree. I don't think we would ever suggest differently. But you go on, it goes on to say, there are, however, sound arguments as to why avocational trapping can and does at times benefit management and strong correlative examples of extensive trapping restrictions leading to increased human wildlife conflicts. So, um, and that, that example comes from Massachusetts, that's one example at least, where in um, 1996, there was a referendum that voted out trapping. Trapping became banned in Massachusetts. Soon after, the population of beaver went up th by, by three. And along with that went the uh, number of complaints from landowners and, and road crews. What happened as a result was that the legislature actually gave municipalities, not the state, but municipalities, the right to hand out permits to actually remove dams and trap beavers. As many beaver now are trapped with the supposedly illegal body gripping trap as are trapped with the cage trap. So I understand the impetus behind that, that petition, that whole effort, that referendum, but I don't think the results actually ended up um, the way that those people hoped it would. Because now the attitude, public attitudes towards beaver and the wetlands they create, sadly the wetlands they create as well, have, have turned and people are much less supportive of beaver and, and wetland habitat. And they now are viewing beaver more as a pest than as a valued fur bearer. And this is something we want to avoid. We need the people to really care about these animals, not think of them as vermin. We have actually had a program for 20 years. Our first line of defense, and when we get a complaint from somebody, whether it's about beaver or if it's about uh, coyotes killing sheep or concerns about, about coyotes and sheep or concerns about skunks under the porch, we always talk first about ha practices that, that might exclude those animals from that activity. And we've had a beaver baffle program, a water control structure pro program for over 20 years where I have a technician who actually spends all season out working with private landowners and town road crews to install water control structures so that people will live with those wetlands and with those beaver if at all possible. I will tell you that in 40 years of experience or at least 20 putting in beaver baffles, it doesn't work all the time. And sometimes the only option is to control the population so that people can live where they're living. And it makes sense when you think about the fact that we, we were developed, our road system was developed without beaver on the landscape. Should it surprise us that as beaver have come back, as we actually introduce them, that we have conflicts? We don't have the cultural carrying capacity to support the beaver that could be here from a biological perspective. That's just, that's just the way it is right now. Um, so this is another piece that came out of that same paper. It basically says, and this is the, this is the paper that, that is quoted by the petitioners, avocational trappers or trapping in general need not have a population level effect on a species or demonstration thereof to justify their potential role or value in reducing localized damage and conflicts. And I called the author, I called the lead author, I called Bryant White to ask him if, there, if he knew of anything in his paper that might suggest the trapping 
uh, is not an important tool for reducing wildlife, human wildlife conflicts. And he said, well, that, how could you even say that when there's a whole federal organization, Wildlife Services, which uses trappings to, trapping to actually address human wildlife conflict? Um, so uh, the author himself was saying this is not a good interpretation of this paper. <coughs> trapping plays a multi-dimensional role in wildlife management. And this is, this is the hardest thing, I think, to, to try to talk about. But we don't need, I don't believe, we need to justify trapping based on its role in wildlife management. I think it connects people to the land. In, in, in it. Maybe it's a different way than other people connect to the land, but it connects people to the land in ways that are important. And it's really a right and a privilege as long, and these are, these are important caveats, which you guys know, as long as it's ecologically sound, sustainable, and leaves room for enjoyment for other publics. We're, we're, that's what we're trying to do here, is balance the needs of one group against the needs of others. And it's a challenge. I mean, it, it's not easy, as you as you folks know. But but this is this is what we're trying to do. And I think the petitioners suggest that um, that we're our our messaging is not consistent around trapping. And and I would say yes, it's consistent. It's just nuanced, and it's complex, complex and complicated. It doesn't fit well into sound bites and into Facebook posts because it's a much bigger, more complex issue than something I can talk about in a half an hour, in, in, in five minutes. Uh, and so the, the, if you don't understand the whole complex issue, you are gonna think that we are perhaps uh, not consistent in the kinds of things that we say. Uh, but I believe that they are yes buts to a lot of this stuff. Uh, the last finding, predators are critical to ecosystem health, yes. Yes, it is. they are. And I don't think anybody in this room would argue with that today. Uh, we manage these fur bearers to ensure that those predators that are on the land and on the landscape can still function in an ecological way. That's what they need to be able to do. They need to still be functioning in, 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 you know, as a prey species, as a predator species on prey. And we believe that based on the current harvesting regime, we are not impacting predator populations to the point where they're affecting, they're not affect, they're not, they're not doing what they're supposed to do on the landscape. And also, it's not affecting people's ability to see and enjoy that they're out there. So we conserve everything. I mean, we're responsible for every living thing that's out there, from uh, invertebrates to wildlife, whoops. Uh, to fish, to natural communities, plants, and the habitats that all of these things depend on. It's a huge responsibility, and it's one that we take incredibly seriously. It's what motivates everybody in the department. I worked there for almost 40 years. I've never been, pr I would never want to work anybody anywhere else. I'm proud to work with the people I work with. They are committed, they're big picture thinkers, they're progressive, they're thoughtful, and it, it really saddens me that, um, that our credibility is being undermined because of people who want to impose a, a, not a biological, but a moral imperative on another group of people. And because that's not something that I personally agree with and, and the department agrees with, then our credibility is maligned. We serve everybody and we take that part of our mission really seriously. Not, e not just today, whoops, whoops. Not just today, but I'll leave that up there. Not just today, but, but for the future too. And, and basically I put this up here because really what it's about, it's so simple. It's about sharing. It's about, okay, you don't have to agree with each other, but it's a resource that we all cherish for different reasons. And it's about learning about how, why other people value something versus why somebody else values something, and then working towards the threats, the big threats. And those are all those things that we keep talking about, habitat loss fragmentation, impacts related to roads, climate change, invasive exotic species, pollution and sedimentation, and disease. These are what are threatening our wildlife populations going forward, not trapping and hunting. In fact, regulated trapping and hunting is just one way that people connect and care 
about wildlife. And I, to, to Walter's point, yes. Are there bad apples out there? Yes. Probably you guys can all point to one or two. That, we don't endorse that activity. Our law enforcement people work hard to try to address those things. But that is, that, you know, there's, there's people out there in every walk of life that don't follow the rules. And that's just something we have to continue to, to try to work on. So the bottom line is that it's about habitat. It's about making sure that these species have the habitat they need in order to live into the future. And that's going to help us with resiliency in the face of climate change. It's going to help us to minimize habitat loss and fragmentation. And it will, it will be what allows us to have sustainable wildlife populations going forward. So I just leave you with a quote from Aldo Leopold, the father of wildlife management. And Aldo was bemoaning the fact that he was on some river where it had been dammed and uh, there was no longer uh, as many fish as there had been when he'd been there previously. This was way back in the 1940s, I think. There were once men capable of inhabiting a river or land without disrupting the harmony of its life. And I think what he meant was that, you know, it, not hunting and fishing. Hunting and fishing doesn't disrupt the harmony of the life. It's the, the drastic changes that we make on the landscape. And, and we all humans, we're, you know, we're all part of this complex system. We all have impacts. And we should be introspective about our own impacts and how we can all live a little bit more lightly on the land. And, and certainly, if you're, if you're getting your food and your fiber from a local, organic, ecologically um, appropriate source, your impacts on the environment are probably far less than if you're buying, buying soy products or industrialized beef at the grocery store, uh, wearing cotton. I mean, all these things have an impact that are much more hard to actually point to, but are having tremendous impacts on our wildlife. So I'm very concerned about the fact that we are polarizing our Vermont public to the point where, instead of working together towards these things, we're actually creating dissension and spending, I'll tell you, a heck of a lot of time on issues that really don't matter to the future of wildlife. I could be spending a lot more time on land conservation and land management and managing species population than writing a response to a petition. But I spent a heck of a lot of time on this response instead of doing those things, and it irks me. So I will leave it at that. Thank you, guys. Well, thank, you. thank you, Kim. Um, so, Chair, if it's your yep. choice, do you want to act on this? And the only exclamation point uh, I will make is I think obviously you could tell from my comments in the presentation that we strongly oppose um, eliminating or even restricting the trapping regulations as they, as they are now in the state of Vermont. And the one point I will make to, to think about everything Ken said, every program we do, whether it's being able to take an honor education course, go to the conservation camps, have technical assistance provided to you as a landowner, a citizen in the state of Vermont, you name it, they, every Vermonter and other people who come to the state have that opportunity to do that. We're not in the business of trying to restrict people. The most restrictive people that we serve are hunters, anglers, and trappers through regulated legal means. So, thank you, Ken. That was yep. excellent. Thank you, Mark. Any, so, any questions before I go on? I say, I assume, should I just go on to the otter one? Do you, would you let's like just, uh, I don't mean do to. Do you have any questions for Kim specific to this? I think we should do their other two presentations because okay. it's just going to be cumbersome. Okay. Getting yeah. Up, getting yeah, that's right. Up. So sure. let's, if there's any questions now related to that one, go ahead and ask her. But I think you just go on. Okay. So this one's a little bit more biologically based, and it, it's the petition to shorten the otter season to the end of February, back to the end of February. If you, you all might remember that we lengthened it, I think, in 2017 uh, to the end of March. And um, first, I just want to mention that it is listed, otter are listed as a species, species of greatest conservation need. In fact, uh, I actually chaired the committee that listed otter back in 2005, and Chris chaired the committee in, I think, 2015 that actually relisted them. Uh, species of conservation need does not mean threatened and endangered. We considered, the committee considered otter to be um, common and abundant. But um, basically what this allows us to do is if there's ever any concerns about destruction of habitat or reduction of, of riparian habitat, 
or possibly um, impacts from toxins like mercury, we can use state wildlife grant funds to actually address that. That's what putting them on the species of greatest conservation need list does for us. We have plenty of other species similar to otter that are common and abundant that are also on the list of species of greatest conservation need, many of which are hunted or trapped. Um, and for the same, very similar reasons, either a concern about potential loss of habitat in the future or possibly concerns about um, some, other, some other disease or other issue. So the premise of the original season expansion, I think we've talked a little bit about this. I'll go through it pretty quickly. It was the, to eliminate the offset trigger on beaver traps, allow the utilization of otter that were caught incidental to beaver during that March season. We just didn't want to see these beautiful animals wasted. And to minimize the harvest of otter that might be taken um, in nuisance beaver sets in late spring and summer, which is why we have a longer beaver season. Uh, the question came up then, why, shorten, why did not just shorten the beaver season uh, to match the otter season? We manage beaver with an eye toward, or we manage otter with an eye towards beaver because beaver are a species that otter spends a lot of time in beaver habitat. And like I mentioned in my last presentation, that road system there, a lot of it was built prior to beaver being restored back on the landscape. So um, the number of calls that we get, our, my technician fields about 400 calls related to human wildlife conflicts in a season and, and does about 50 site visits. Um, and so he's pretty busy. And so we are trying to manage the beaver population to minimize the take outside of the season when they would get wasted. We want those beaver to be utilized. But does our current data support this change? And it's a good question. I, I appreciate the question. I think we, we need to be very careful about this expansion and make sure that we're not impacting the population. Um, so we reviewed the biological data um, and we found that um, since, since the change, since 2017, we have really only 42 people who successfully trapped otter in the whole state on an annual basis. That's an average over the last three years. Each one takes an average of two. So it's a pretty small number. Uh, the highest average, it went at, the, at the highest at harvest, only one otter is being taken every 94 square miles, which is like the size of three towns in Vermont. Um, and the trapper mail survey, which began in 87, has been mandatory since this same rule change. So we're getting good data back. <laughs> this is a map of the otter taken in 2019. And you can see there's some clustering. It's usually related to either where the trapper effort is and or where the best otter habitat is. That, that western side of the state is pretty much the Otter Creek drainage. <coughs> you would expect that probably more otter would come out of there than some of the mountain regions. But you can also see from that that of the 7,100 miles of, of waterways in Vermont, there's a lot of waterways that aren't getting any kind of impact from, from the water. <coughs> this is a graph, and it's a little messy, but um, if you look at the orange line, that's the number of successful trappers. And the blue line is the average number harvest, otter harvested per trapper. Uh, both are relatively stable over time. The, the number of successful trappers has declined since, since the um, petition was in implemented, or, or actually, yeah. Rule change. Rule change, thank you. Um, but it's it probably the decline is from um, a whole, the, a drop in pelt prices. Uh, the, actually, it's, the markets really kind of crashed in, in places. COVID actually uh, eliminated the market for, for some of these species in Canada. Um, so we're not surprised about that decline. And it's just a very small number of people that are, that are successful right now. That, it's in line with our trapping sales. You can see that, that they had a bump up in like 2012, and then they've kind of steadied but declined a little bit as well. Uh, the otter harvest is pretty stable. It goes up and down, but over time, it's pretty stable. And you can see we made three season changes to the otter harvest, um, one back in 1980, I think that is. 88, uh, we reduced the season from uh, October 25th to March to October 25th to the middle of February. So we shortened the season then. Uh, we actually increased it in 2001 and two, I think, 
Uh, we increased it back to the end of February, and then the most recent increase uh, was to the end of March. It doesn't appear that these season changes, the expansions, had much effect on the harvest. In fact, the most recent one, we've had some of the lowest harvests we've had in a long time. And it's, you know, the, the, the fact that the population is healthy and stable is supported by our otter catch for 100 trap nights. The trend in that is, is also relatively stable, although um, we've had a couple of years of, of pretty high otter catch for 100 trap nights. So this is, you know, several different indices are suggesting that this, this season change has really not had a tremendous effect. Uh, one of the things that we noticed, and, and this'll, this might, those of you who were on the board back then will remember, uh, this is a, a graph of the number of otter, the blue is 2013 to 2016, the number of otter taken by month. And you can see February was a pretty low number. And from that, we projected that March would be at least as low. I think we guessed, uh, I think we estimated 10 otter would be taken in March. Uh, the average harvest in March over the three years has been 16.6, almost 17. So it's, it's not awful, it's a little higher than, than what we projected. Um, but you can see that the effort has shifted. It's shifted from the months of November and January and into the months of, of February and March. It, people are trapping later in the season. Okay, that's a little bit, could be a little bit concerning because of what Rob suggested about the concern about pups and, and orphaning pups. So we looked at that pretty carefully. And if you look at 2017, uh, we actually took only two females of breeding age in 2017-18. We took 10, we took 19 otter total, but only two of those were females of breeding age. In 2018-19, uh, we took only one female of breeding age out of 11. And then in 2019-20, so far, I mean, we have to do some more aging because of COVID, we didn't get all the carcasses in on time last year, so we're aging them this year. There may be a few more than one, it might be two or three, uh, but a very small number out of these 20 that were taken in March of last year. And you can see also at the bottom, uh, the percentage of people that were actually targeting beaver during that season. So it is possible that some of those otter might have been taken anyway, even if we had kept the season short. So what this may end up doing, and we're not sure about this yet, this is pretty preliminary, but it looks like the trend in males to females is increasing. So, and, and that makes sense when you think about it, when you, move, when you move your effort into the spring, when you're getting closer to parturition and females are gonna sort of um, shrink their home ranges, males are still out there, they're gonna become a more predominant part of the harvest. And, and this has been found in New York where they have a season through April, they see that 70% of their harvest is, is actually male otter. So it's not surprising, but we're waiting to see whether this actually continues. We don't know yet. So in summary, um, the number of trappers taking, taking otter is very low, 42 around the whole state. The average number of otter taken is, is 2.1. We have many miles of, of waterway that are not even impacted. Um, since the season expansion, the total season harvest is lower uh, than, it, than the average that it was prior to that. So it, it was 192, that to, total season, season harvest average was 192 between 2010 and 2016, and 109 between 2017 and 2020. This isn't because of the expansion, this was as the expansion, so we actually have less effort going on out there probably. Um, there's been a shift in effort to later in the season, which may result in an increasing trend in males. Uh, which would be a good thing. And the number of females of breeding age in March is really low, uh, one to two per year. And that's, you know, if we could keep it fairly low, uh, that would be a great, that would be great. Because we'd be kind of accomplishing several goals at once. If it changes, if we see that this is potentially impacting this population going forward, we'll come back to the board. We'll continue to look at these, these indices and data very carefully, and we'll be back if, if, if we have concerns. So, Vermont's river otter population, we believe, seems to be healthy, stable, and widespread. 
and uh, that's a great thing. Uh, I guess not questions yet, right, Tim? Keep going. I think if you have specific questions about that, that's fine. Any, any Dave? Or I'd just uh, like you to do it. The, uh, if you could go back to the summary on the, the, the right there. Um, so the take between 2010 and 2016 was 192. Average, average. yeah. And the take was 109, uh, was 2017, 2020. What's the difference on the amount of trappers per? There's some that may infer that as a decline in population right. versus actual number right. of the right. trappers. And, and, and that, if, if, that, if, that, if that decline happened uh, as a result of that change in the harvest, because it, it happened during the year that we made the change. Right. So it, it, we have information, our, basically the catch per unit of in, in, effort information would help or not on that. I mean, in terms of numbers of trappers before and after. I mean, the successful number of trappers, you can see from that graph, is higher before. So you can see how the six, number of successful trappers is the orange. It goes up and down and up and down. It had started to decline um, even before that. But I think it's probably more to do, at least based on what we're seeing with the, with the information and data that we have, it's probably more to do with pelt prices, decline in pelt prices, um, than it is an effort, than it is to do with a decline in the population. Okay, and, and as far as the number of trappers or trapping licenses, um, has, that, has that been a decline as well? Like yeah, that's, uh, well, you can see it here. It peaked in like 2012 or 13, or not, it didn't peak then, I mean it peaked way, way back, but there was a peak when we had very high um, pelt prices in, yeah. that, in that period of time, yeah. and it slowly sort of declined as well. And, and of that, I mean, we're talking of an aging population here, I hate to say it, yeah. um, and so we have a lot of people buying licenses. These are regular trappers, but the, the number of those that are actually going out anymore is, is declining. But, I mean, we can look into all that stuff a little further. I don't know, Katie, do you have anything or Chris to add to that? Well, just go forward one slide, or two slides. The slide with the, no, I guess it's back, I'm sorry. <laughs> the, the, the number of successful different. There, okay. The, the average number harvested per trapper hasn't declined at all. Yeah. And, and it just to me, when I look at the, this comparison, it's not, it, 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 the, the concern of the number of successful trappers going down doesn't bear out. I mean, those there are fewer trappers, but those that are trapping are still harvesting the same number of otter. If it was a population-related decline, you would also see a decline in the average number of harvested per trapper. Mm -hmm. And then the, the CPUE data as well is a, is a second measure of that. Where right. you know, there it is. I mean, it, there's actually increase in catch per unit of effort, which would be indicative of, of right. increasing population. Yeah, and that will, you know, that's, this is early to actually take that to the bank yet, but we'll watch that trend going forward. Um, okay, so I am gonna, if, if there's no other, oh yeah. Can you, can you just go back to the percentage of, right there, trappers? Yeah. Trying for beaver, next one. Uh, percentage up. of trappers trying for beaver but taking otter. Uh, no, you were on it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Wait, that one. Yeah. One, one more. more. Perfect. Oh, that one. I okay. Just see yeah. The numbers again. Yeah. Sorry. So that's percentage targeting beaver that got. That's right. That's the percentage of the Game twenty market. that actually were they in our blue card data. We asked them what they're targeting, and that's the percentage that said they were targeting beaver. Um, so it, it varies, you know, it was, it was higher this year, this past year than, than it was initially, but, you know, and a lot of that is just based on whether it's a human-wildlife conflict. Even during the season, we try to get people who have human-wildlife conflicts to at least do the trapping during the season rather than in the summer when the animal is not um, prime and probably, except for the meat, is gonna get wasted. What weather have anything to do with that? Like, Say that again? Does weather have anything to do with it? Oh, Maybe with the shifting? The, so it's an easier spring, harder spring? Exactly. Okay. That has a huge effect. Yep. Yep. 
Okay. Um, I'm only going to, because we talked about the rodenticides already, I'm just going to, I'm going to probably turn this over to you except to say, you know, we're going to keep testing for those. If anybody has an interest in the results of those at some point, once we get them back, I'm hoping, you know, there'll be some regional, regional results soon too. And I'll just want to say that, um, you know, Katie's going to go into the details, but this is just the results from the Martin camera work that's being done in the Southern Green Mountain National Forest. We're in cooperation with the Central Connecticut State University. And um, so we've got cameras out. So it's not just about our data. It's not just about our harvest data. There's other, and I think Katie will have a map from other camera collections. But you can see here, the red are cameras that picked up six fisher or more. The yellow, the beige are, are five, I think. The yellow are four. And I think, I believe that what um, the researcher told me was that out of 51 cameras, 49 had fisher pictures, at least one. So in terms of whether or not this population is at risk, it really, in, at least in this region, it really does not look like it uh, based on the camera work that we've, we've got done. We, got, you know, we can get cat for unit of effort on cameras too. So I'm going to turn it over to Katie because she can actually explain this much better than I can. Yeah. Thanks, Kim. Sure. Oops, sorry. <laughs> I can trip you. <laughs> Hello. That piece is settling in, that's why we're getting it. Yeah, that wasn't a very enthusiastic response. I was expecting more. So just as a reminder, I'm uh, Dr. Katie Geeter. I'm the biometrician and research manager for Vermont Fish and Wildlife. I've been working there about four years now. Um, I'm going to be going through the Fisher petition, which is to place a moratorium on Fisher trapping. And so I'll be presenting uh, Vermont Fish and Wildlife's response um, kind of in three parts. I wanted to start just by bringing us back to the mission. Um, Vermont Fish and Wildlife's mission is the conservation of fish wildlife plants and their habitats for the people of Vermont. So the people means all people, all values, all benefits. Just like what Kim was speaking to uh, through both of her presentations, uh, our mission is really to provide those benefits for all. And that includes a complex set of balancing different biological, social, and environmental factors. So I just wanted to place our, the department's response within that context. And I'll come back to that. But I wanted to dive right into the petition and the next 10 slides or so will present responses to specific parts of that petition. So. What you see in, in the red writing and the quotes are, is directly taken from the Fisher petition. Um, and I wanted to point out some scientific facts um, using these. So the first is Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department has not taken management action to maintain a sustainable fisher population, one that is similar to that inferred from the CPUE in 1992 to 2004. So CPUE is catch per unit of effort. This means that you have a trapper who sets a line and for whatever species they're trapping, they catch that number of animals within a certain time frame that they have the trap running for. So the unit of effort there is what, what is used is the trap nights. That's a 24 hour period. So if you have a trap line running with five traps for five nights, then that's your unit of effort and the five animals that you catch is the number of animals, CPUE is calculated by taking that number of animals and the trapping effort and uh, calculating a catch per hundred trap nights. And that is only one index of a population. It's an index of a population, which means that it doesn't equate to a population um, at all, um, in no way, shape, or form. 
it is an index of a population that is combined with a lot of other indices of populations like sex and age trends, sightings, roadkill, and surveys. This isn't to say that CPUE is not valuable. It is. It's just not a population. It, you cannot infer a population from CPUE. And I will probably say that again about 10 times before this presentation is over. CPUE is just one index. Um, the reason why um, we use all these indices is because wildlife is so difficult to track. You can't just go out into the wild and count um, the species that you'd like to get an idea of. Um, and even if you wanted to do that, even if you had the capacity to do that, you're still only getting a minute snapshot in time. So just as an example, say the Fish and Wildlife Department had a bunch of money. I know, funny, right? <laughs> um, and a bunch of employees. Uh, so many of them, we, we wouldn't know what to do with them. Say we could go out and count these species. Um, well, the most direct way of counting wildlife that we currently have using technology is probably by cameras. And so if you take the number of count points that you, you would need to do over the entire state of Vermont for forest habitat for a species like Fisher, you'd end up with thousands of individual count points that you'd have to cover. And that would end up in costs for cameras, SD cards, staff and labor costs, gas and mileage, data hosting and analysis, and it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars and you would still only get that one two week time frame. Another couple months later could be a completely different scenario. So it's not so easy to count animals and it's certainly not possible to infer a population from one simple indices alone index alone. So um, there it is again. <laughs> One index is not a whole picture. The analysis of the fisher population presents evidence that supports a decision that the season for fisher should be closed. That the evidence that is used in um, the petition is CPUE. However, there are many other factors like diseases that Kim mentioned. Um, toxins, uh, climate change, development, prey, hunting and trapping, and other recreational pursuits like biking and habitat factors and uh, cars on roads that can affect a population. And if you're only using one simple index based on hunting or trapping, then you're not getting the whole picture. Uh, you are not it, it can actually end up obscuring all of the other factors that can indeed um, and do affect wildlife hugely. So specifically, some of the statistical analysis that is presented in the petition is not valid. Um, here's another quote, CPUE data calculated using the VTFWD method and the traditional method provides little help in evaluating any trends in the monitored population. Uh, it took me a while to figure out what the VTFWD method and the traditional method actually uh, meant. It wasn't described very well, so I recreated uh, the data and um, spent some time analyzing it in different ways until I figured out how what these me two methods meant, um, since there wasn't any um, real explanation provided. Uh, but basically, what the VTFWD method is, um, they're both methods of just calculating a CPUE by taking the total number of animals and taking um, the total number of, um, of, of effort and calculating a CPUE that way. The difference is, it, the difference still gives you one measure of CPUE per year, so that's not what the department uses in analyzing and inferring um, animal populations. But basically, the traditional method takes the total catch in one year and the total effort in one year and just divides it the catch by the effort. 
The problem with doing that is that it doesn't account for many trappers out there who might not catch anything. Um, it doesn't count those zeros if you calculate it that way, statistically. Um, it's also not at the sample level. If you're sampling a population, you want to calculate that measure on the sample level, which is the trap line. You don't want to just take an entire total and use that, um, because that's going to obscure a lot of the nuances in that data. And I did actually provide an explanation of this. Um, this quote in green is from an email I sent uh, to the petitioners to explain why calculating CPUE in the way that they do, that traditional method that, that they espouse, why that traditional method is not statistically valid. Um, and so that's that quote over there um, from my response. And uh, I offered to explain it further um, to their biostatistician uh, colleague that was mentioned. And uh, I was told that they didn't uh, work for the department, with the department for obvious reasons. I'm not sure what those reasons are, but um, regardless, I couldn't give any more explanation than that. Um, so another quote from the petition is that the VT method introduces substantial variability. This is the VTFW method, which again, it only gives you one measure of CPUE um, per year. So it's really not what we use in our analyses to infer population. But basically, this method that they refer to is taking each trap line CPUE and then averaging it out to get one average per year. Um, it's a minor difference, but the reason that they give for not using it is that the, da that the data is substantially vari variable. And that's what I'd like to point out here, is that data is and should be variable. If you don't have variable data, that's a problem. You're, you're doing something wrong. <laughs> the natural world is complex and convoluted, and you want your data to reflect that. So I'm not really sure what the um, petitioner's issue with variability is, but it's actually a good thing for statistics. So this is our CPUE that is calculated per year. That's what this graph is showing. It's showing those individual circles. There's too, there's too many of them each year to really show them very, very clearly. But you can see that there's <coughs> multiple little circles each year. Each of those circles represents an individual trap line. That's why you see a lot of zeros in, in each year, because there's a lot of trappers that don't catch anything. Um, you also have some where those hundreds in 2019 and uh, 1993, that was one trapper that happened to run two traps for two trap nights and caught two fisher. So that's what that is. But it still reflects the reality of what those trappers are catching and the nuances of it. And that's what we look at. This is what we analyze. We don't analyze one CPUE measure per year. We might present that as a trend uh, just for visible visual purposes, because this is difficult to interpret visually, but analysis-wise, this is what we analyze. So um, the petitioners did a statistical comparison um, of CPUE that is shown in this, hopefully that's showing up right. It looks really fluorescent green on that screen, but hopefully you can all see this line over here. Yep. Yeah. 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 So, <laughs> yeah. So um, this is taken directly from the petition, by the way, um, this, this graph. So I do apologize if it's not too visible or anything like that. Um, but each of these points here in the line is an average CPUE that's calculated by taking the total number of animals and the total number of effort and calculating one CPUE from it. So that's the comparison that's presented here um, in the petition. That's the statistical analysis that is being done on that data, one point per year. Um, so statistical comparison that documents that the Fisher harvest since 2003 has been significantly below the lower 95% confidence limit of the mean harvest from 1990 to 2004. So 
I actually, I didn't see any mention of CPUE here. I saw harvest. Um, and the mean, if you look at the mean harvest from this data, it's actually almost the same between these two periods. So there were a lot of statements in the petition like this that were a little bit confusing because I think the petitioners were confusing CPUE with harvest. And so it was difficult even for me to uh, kind of interpret, but this statement is just false. It's that harvest is a difference of three individuals. It's really not, not different. And the other aspect of this is that CPUE dropped below the lower 95% confidence limit or almost two standard errors below the mean of the baseline period. I know, I'm, <laughs> I'm losing some of you here because this is where it starts to get into some of the more nuanced statistics, except this isn't nuanced statistics. Uh, this is really quite basic and um, a false statement because a confidence limit is different than a standard error. Um, and if you understand what they mean, I'm not going to try and explain it here because it gets into um, equations that are um, going to just lose you entirely. But essentially, what it means is that if you make that statement, you're basically saying that your CPUE dropped from the top red line to the lower red line. Um, that's two standard errors below the mean of the baseline period. So I'm not sure what the petitions are tr petitioners are trying to say here. I think that they mean that they're trying to show a decrease in the CPUE um, that, that shows in the, in the period uh, from 2004 to 2019. But the understanding of statistics is, um, is not quite there. So it took me a while to actually even understand what the petition was saying. So, and here's the bigger picture, because that CPUE trend does show, it's based on one measure per year, okay, but it does show a decrease. Um, and so here's the bigger picture um, for that. When there's a statement made that CPUE dropped below something, this is the data that the department uses, these blue dots here. Um, this is individual CPUE for each trap line. And so the bigger picture starts to emerge that that decrease is really being driven by some pretty high individual, maybe 10 or 15 points in total that drove that CPUE up during that period. And essentially, the CPUE remained the same. If you run a regression on all those points, it doesn't have a trend. It doesn't have a decreasing trend. It is being driven by a few trappers that happen to have higher CPUEs. Doesn't mean that they're catching more fisher, as I showed with the average number of fisher. That didn't change. They just happen to catch Fisher in fewer, with fewer effort. And so if you look at the effort versus the catch, you'll see that there was a season change in 2004 where the season was extended from two weeks to one month. Yeah. Yeah. So um, because of that, if you look at that blue line, the blue line in that graph, is this, the total of trap nights for that year. And the total catch is in orange. Right after that season extension, you see those lines flip. Because the CPUE never changed. The catch, the average catch didn't change. It was just that there was more effort now because the season is a month longer. That's what drove the CPUE down. Also, because we don't only look at CPUE, you have to look at all aspects of uh, population dynamics. The male to female ratio for Fisher from 2004 to 2019, it, it's been remarkably quite stable um, during that whole period. There hasn't been any change. 
if there was a change in a population, you would expect this index to vary more or to trend down or up. Same thing for age ratios. So if you look at the proportion of juveniles in the harvest, that too has been remarkably stable um, every year, right around 4.5. Um, and it doesn't really vary much beyond that. And so those two indices give us more um, evidence that the population is stable. Um, moving into even more bigger picture into some of our collaborations that we have with other researchers that Kim, Kim mentioned the camera studies that we've been working on with University of Connecticut. There's another camera study that we've been working um, on through the University of New Hampshire that is actually, it, it's kind of going to be ongoing um, moving into some other species and involving University of Vermont as well. But the results from this study, part of the results from this study um, that I have from a paper in 2019 by Alexei Serenadel shows that what, what the left-hand map is showing with the green, that is basically the probability of occupancy that's derived from cameras. Um, it's a mathematical model. It's, commonly used and it's very well verified in the research, it shows that basically that bright green is about 90% occupancy of habitat, um, probability, probability of occupancy of habitat. So that's showing that across a wide swath of Vermont, Fisher have a high likelihood of occurring in those habitats. Um, that's a big area of Vermont. That's huge. It's, that tells us that Fisher are very well distributed across Vermont. Um, and when we actually have those cameras out and they're collecting detections, those detections are high. Um, and so they're high in every place where cameras are um, located. So all of this tells us that Fisher are widespread, um, their populations are stable, and uh, they're doing quite well in Vermont. Um, so the other uh, point in the petition that is made uh, relates to a baseline period where the petitioners say, we also believe that if the baseline period were extended further back, it is likely that the situation would be even worse. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what this baseline period is, is based on. Um, there is no context for any kind of stability during 1990 to 2004 that it's based on. Uh, there's no acceptable threshold for Fisher population numbers or CPUE um, or any kind of, I guess, thought process uh, for why this is a baseline period. I really couldn't uh, figure out uh, why this was the baseline period. Um, and in fact, uh, if you extended it further back, the situation would be even worse. Well, for historical context, Fisher were so endangered, like Kim mentioned in the past, that they had to be reintroduced. Um, so this concept of shifting baselines, I think, is, um, is a little bit tenuous because there's no reason given for why 1990 to 2004 is such a great baseline. Um, it also discounts all the other years um, prior to that, that Fisher were on the landscape. Um, and so the Fisher petition really ignores a lot of the complexity that Kim and now I am trying to emphasize in wildlife species management. Um, you, you don't, with harvest data that gives us quite a lot of really valuable information, you don't only have catch per unit of effort, you also have sex and age data for a lot of the species. You collect disease and toxicity information um, that can be used for surveillance. And all of that is in the context of expert statistical knowledge and analysis um, that goes into this. And on top of that, there's also road incidental mortality, camera networks that we've mentioned, um, general habitat approaches like Vermont conservation design 
Um, forest and land cover data, habitat surveys, public opinion surveys, I, I could go on and on. I, I couldn't really fit it in the slide, but we use a ton of different um, science to back up uh, our, our decisions for managing the species. So the three, I'll just end the, this uh, petition response with three, going over three of the main points that were made at the end of the petition. So these are three of the, um, this was like the evidence that was given for the Fisher Moratorium. And this is taken directly from the petition. So starting with the first, significant decline in the number of fishers trapped over the last 15 years. Uh, this, as I've already shown, um, through average catch uh, not changing is, is false. There's no significant decline in the number of fishers trapped. And that bears true for, so, when we report the number of animals that are trapped, uh, the, the CPUE calculation is, is different in that for fur bearer reports, the reported uh, number is, it is now uh, more with mandatory reporting, it's more in line with what it, the actual number is, but before mandatory reporting, in some years, if you didn't, get a high percentage um, of reports back, you might be undercounting those species, um, total catches. So that was um, adjusted um, using records, uh, for, for records, uh, for some species. And so that was adjusted to reflect more of the actual number um, that would have been reported if you had 100% reporting rate. So that's the derived average here. Um, in those green boxes. And the reported average is just how many um, the trapper reports uh, reported. Uh, but it, it really doesn't matter how you calculate it because both of them are not very, there's no significant decline there. And actually the derived average shows an increase um, in the number of fish are trapped over the last 15 years. So um, there's really not much of a difference. Um, here's the trend line for reported catch and derived catch. And you can see actually, um, that in more recent years they match up uh, more closely because of mandatory reporting. But regardless, there's no declining trend there. Um, certainly no uh, trend at all. And so moving on to the second uh, point, that significant decline in Fisher CPUE over the last 15 years. As I explained before, effort increased as a result of season change. Uh, catch didn't change, effort did, and that's what uh, made it appear like the CPUE declined. Finally, uh, Fisher Harvest since 2003 has been significantly below the lower 95% confidence limit of the mean harvest from 1990 to 2004, a proposed surrogate for a sustainable population. Uh, the first part of this statement is false, as I've shown, and CPUE does not equate to population. It's a useful index, but it, you cannot use it alone to infer a population. Um, and so the last part of this presentation, I just wanted to touch upon something that kind of bothered me with this petition, specifically because I, try, I tried to reach out to explain the science. And this relates to this idea of fallacies and how it affects the departments ability to conduct the great work um, that they do. And so when there's this um, issue of a shifting baseline, this is the baseline that, this is the historical context that Vermont's wildlife conservation and management is based on. Before the department existed, there was really low forest cover. Um, there was many species were in severe decline to a point where they needed to be reintroduced. And today there's 80% forest cover across Vermont. There's, lar there's um, studies that have shown that Vermont has some of the largest unbroken habitat tracts and highest species richness of all New England states. So this is a, this uh, figure here is from um, 
a graduate student at UVM who did her doctoral research on um, predicting the habitat um, and occurrence of 10 common species, wildlife species in Vermont. And she's doing a, um, a postdoctoral degree right now, um, working on projecting these models forward, which I'll show in a little bit. But basically, Vermont outlined um, in black compared to all the other New England states, the red is high species richness. This was based on um, a ton of data that was gathered on expert opinion, on species occurrence data, camera data, um, land cover data, and it showed that Vermont is in really quite a great place right now for species richness and for habitat. We, we're in a great situation right now. And that is no accident. It's because of this department's work. It's because of a number of other organizations' work. It's because of the collaborations that we do. It's because of all this hard work that goes on that everyone wants for wildlife conservation. And when you make false statements and um, um, make errors in, in trying to interpret data uh, from a statistical standpoint um, that is just wrong, then you undermine um, expertise, trust, and credibility that has taken years and years to, to culture. Um, and so I, I want to hark on this fallacies point because <coughs> poor science is when you take a single metric and a value you don't explain a baseline, you use inappropriate statistics, and, and this increases the likelihood that your, that your conclusions will be biased. Um, it basically just manipulates data to support an opinion, and it doesn't account for all the other indices and data and threats that you have to um, incorporate for wildlife management. But most of all, it, it dilutes the value of science, and, and that's what probably bothers me the most about this particular petition. Um, is that it, it flies in the face of good science. And as a biometrician and a scientist, I, I've always loved animals from a very, very young age, but I was always fascinated in the why. I always wanted to understand the answer of why something was the way it was. And so I've always been a huge proponent of using the best available science and using the best methods. And diluting the value of science does nothing to help wildlife conservation. Um, a, a quote by uh, a scientist, Eugenie Clark, um, she was in the medical field. Um, she, she said once that we ignore public understanding of science at our own peril. And I think that's why you've heard from Kim um, about all the hard work that we do to try to engage the public. It's so important that the public has a good understanding of what we do, of wildlife management and science, because otherwise you risk getting quotes like science-based wildlife management requires no special training. Well, it does, and science-based wildlife management is simple, and it's not. And wildlife scientists put their personal values first. Well, they don't, and wildlife scientists can't be trusted, and they obviously can, but you risk all that if you don't really work hard to connect people with the land and have them understand what you do. And so I just wanted to end here with emphasizing that this is where we're at right now. Vermont Fish and Wildlife conserves and protects hundreds of thousands of acres of land. It's, it also conserves um, many animal and plant threatened and endangered species in addition to the species that it that it manages and it's involved in not just wildlife recovery but habitat and, and fish as well and science fallacies put all this at risk um, and i wanted to end here with the follow-up to that that graduate student, Pier, uh, Sky Pierman Gilman et al., that, that uh, figure I put up before that showed the, 
wildlife species diversity in Vermont. This is from a follow-up paper to that where she predicted, based on different scenarios moving forward in the next 50 to 100 years, what New England would be facing depending on um, different scenarios of development and climate change moving forward. And so under, under all these scenarios, I just want to point out that this top one is our current situation. All the rest are future projections. And look at that red. That red indicates species diversity, the high species diversity that we have right now. Under any scenario, any future scenario, we stand to lose that. Um, that's really scary. So we really need to keep working at conserving species and their habitat. It's so important, and we can't do that if science is constantly being attacked and diluted. And so I just wanted to end by showing that um, and the important work that is at stake here. Thank you. Are there any questions for Katie? I just, I already asked him earlier, but I'm not sure everyone else heard it, and I thought it might be somewhat beneficial. But the uh, part of that uh, petition, there was a reference to the livers from the um, from the fishers that were sent for testing, and uh, they're basically asking for a moratorium on, on the trapping. I think it was important to point out that the livers were a product of trappers. Is that correct? That's correct. And the other uh, aspect of that, if there is something that may be of interest, such as uh, a new disease or something that they're studying, I think based on what we're seeing and uh, that continuing the trapping gives you more samples to continue the study. And, and that would be your best your best uh, collection effort. I would say. It's, it's allowed us to collect on a whole host of diseases and toxins that would have been a lot more challenging to, to actually collect that kind of information if we had to ask for volunteers to you know, send them in. Well, let's move back up front for further discussion. Act on each of the petitions individually, just so we have a clear record. Um, and I would suggest we do that on the first three and then discuss the uh, live action trial camera petition after. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to go through them discussion-wise in the way that they were presented to us uh, from the department. Um, so uh, the petitioners have had their chance to say what they wanted to say, but if there are any further questions for the petitioners, the specific things you're looking for, I don't know if you're here anymore. No. Apparently where, not. where are the petitioners? I guess they left. I was just wondering. Uh, well, I should say, though, that Lisa is not on the line anymore, but she did say if we have questions for her, we can get her back on the line. So, but the others have apparently left. Um, so let's talk about the uh, uh, Mr. Medlin's petition. Is there any discussion on that? Any motions or any questions for the department? Uh, I would just a comment. I was going to say from obviously both presentations but from yours it basically says that quoting a past college professor statistics don't lie but liars use statistics um, so you made that clear and I was thankful for that Jay I just had a question uh, uh, sister's not here but maybe somebody else can answer it um, you made a comment that Fishers compete for some of the game, same game species targeted by hunters. What do what fishers target for food source? Uh, small mammals, snowshoe hare. You know, they were introduced, reintroduced for porcupine, um, and they do take porcupine, but, you know, squirrels, any small mammal. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that's a misrepresentation of, of why we have a season on fisher. In my opinion. Thank you. Bill? Just a couple of notes. Uh, when I asked Lisa if she could tell us where the 19 fishermen were taken, and somebody asked her, 
who wrote the paper if you couldn't give us a name. Um, that bothers me that those are facts that are being thrown out there that they don't have any backing for. Uh, whether or not she presents it later on, I don't know. But we're here to make a decision on facts that are not backed up by somebody else. You know, It just hurts me a little bit. The only comment I had about Kim's presentation was that I, I kind of disagreed with her statement that they that uh, trapping has no bearing on non-hunters' ability to access and enjoy wildlife. And I think that that's vastly under understating the value of trapping, personally, because I think that it has incredibly enhanced their ability to enjoy that, um, but perhaps we were just being too humble. But that—that that was my take on it. I think that that uh, if it wasn't for trappers, or hunters, or fishers uh, to bring back a lot of these species, they wouldn't be around for people to enjoy. So that's that's my only comment on that. Is there a motion? Yeah. And this is on the, the this is on addition to suspend Lynch. trapping seasons. Yes. Mr. Medley's position. Well, the first one. It's. Moratorium on the Fisher trap. Well, I, I brought it up. We were going to do it in the way that Kim presented. So she oh, okay. she responded well, to Walters first. Sorry Which that. one is that? Petition to suspend trapping seasons. That was with the 10 findings. Okay. Yeah. I'd like to make a motion that we reject that petition. No second. Okay, so we have Brian to deny the petition, and that sounded like Marty. Is that Marty? Yeah. Marty was the second. Is there any further discussion on that? I would like to compliment on your rebuttal to the petition. It's very well, very well done. I <coughs> cannot imagine the time that was put into your response. Thank you. Very well done. Does that, does that motion include uh, the suspension to the moratorium? No. no. This is no. This is just the motion on just the one petition that was presented by Walter Medwood. Yeah. The second one listed on your <coughs> agenda: petition to close trapping season and petition to suspend trapping. Okay. Yeah. And so a, a yes vote would be to deny that. That's correct. There was, for clarification, there was two aspects of that petition. Yeah. yeah. Was to close the trapping season and then that, and also ask for closing harvest of red and gray fog. Yeah. It named about six species. It did not name all the fur bears no. in the state. So, but, so you, that's what you're denying. You want to make it clear that you're denying both aspects of that petition. Yeah, that's, that's correct. correct. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The entire packet we got from no more discussion, so I will go around the horn here. A yes would be to deny that petition uh, in its entirety as it was given to us. Uh, a no would be obviously the opposite. So Brian Bailey. Yes. Mike Bancroft. Yes. I'm a yes. Wendy Butler. Yes. Adam Dave not here. Mike Colson. Yes. This is not here. Brian McCarthy. Yes. Dave Robart. Yes. Jay Sweeney. Yes. Marty Van Buren. Yes. Bill Pickens. Yes. All right, that petition is denied. Okay, next up uh, on our agenda tonight, we will get into the uh, second one that Kim did, which was the, hold on, I saw some many tonight, otters. Yeah, otters was the second one, yep. Is there any discussion on the petition to return the end of trapping season for river otters to February 28th? Any questions, comments? Pretty quiet crowd. Well, I'll say that, that I, I commend on all of these presentations by the board, by the uh, agency, uh, because I think it's very, very easy when you are very passionate about a subject to find information to support your position. Um, unfortunately, that, that information sometimes is not backed by sound. Uh, practices or science, and, and uh, I have no reason to believe that the information that was presented to us by Kim or, or Dr. Geider tonight 
Um, does it have solid backing in, in the world, in the, the, the world we live in, in fish and wildlife? And I found it very educational, um, and, and I, I haven't found anything in this presentation of the petition that leads me to believe that we have a reason to change this. Um, and I'll make a motion that we deny this petition. I second the motion. Yay, makes motion. Brian seconds. Is there any further discussion on that? It was, uh, it was an interesting presentation. It was, I mean, I will say it was interesting to follow up with the change that happened, you know, yeah. four years ago and see what has resulted from that. Yeah. But it was also encouraging to see that I think populations are still just fine. So, any more discussion on that? So a yes would be to deny the petition. Uh, Brian Bailey. Yes. Mike Bancroft. Yes. I'm a yes. Wendy Butler? Yes. Mike Colson? Yes. Brian McCarthy? Yes. Dave Robillard? Yes. Dave Sweeney? Yes. Marty Van Buren? Yes. Bill Pickens? Yes. That is denied. And then the last on these petitions would be the Fisher. Is there any discussion on the Fisher petition? Mm -hmm. I'd just like to say that. Uh, in reading that and having waited in light of uh, further education we received tonight, was that there was no compelling evidence whatsoever that birds practices are detrimental to the abundance or health of the, of the wildlife. And uh, I, I can't see support for that, that petition. Uh, Bill. Okay. This is not scientific. This is just a dumb trapper doing his thing. I've been trapping the same trap line since about the late 1970s. And myself and my partners catch for Fisher has gone up or down by four fishers per year over that time period. And we normally trap from December 1st to about the 16th or 17th of December, and then we quit because we've got all the fishery that we want to catch. In the last year, the last three years, we have averaged 18 fisher a year off that trap line. Wow. I can't see that we're fisher population is declining. Not in, not in that area. But I don't live in downtown Burlington either. Okay. Any more discussion on that? It is disappointing that they're not here to, mm -hmm. to answer questions. I just want to say that. I think this is a, a repeating occurrence and uh, it consumes a massive amount of time. And so I make a motion. Uh, I was disappointed. Yeah, Marty? Yeah. Marty's made a motion to deny. I'm sorry, who was the second? Jay. Jay. Any further discussion? I would like to suggest that if petitioners are going to bring a petition to us and um, use uh, resources to um, make a presentation and inform us that they need to stay. Because it's, to me, it's equal to somebody plugging their ears. Mm -hmm. like that's, I think that's disrespectful. Given the amount of time that was put into the response and, and the offer to work together multiple times, I think, that we saw tonight is uh, disappointing. This is another part of the circle. We'll be back here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Insanity. Any further discussion on that? Okay. The yes would be to deny that. Brian Bailey? Yeah. 
Mike Bancroft? Yes. I'm a yes. Wendy Butler? Yes. Mike Colson? Yes. Brian McCarthy? Yes. Dave Robillard? Yes. Jay Sweeney? Yes. Marty Van Buren? Yes. And Bill Pickens? Yes. And he's denied. Last up on our agenda tonight is the cell phone camera position, and that petitioner has also left. So that uh, that's my part, and uh, I, I won't give you a uh, scientific response as you saw from the biologist earlier for two reasons. One is I'm not capable, and the second is uh, this petition is really not a biological question um, either way. Uh, it's not necessary to use cell phone cameras for the management of species and for successful hunting. It's also not uh, having any impact on harvest and population uh, uh, aspects of the population um, by increasing harvest. So this is really a this is really a social question. Um, I thought that the uh, petitioner made a uh, made a, 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 an interesting and, and important point when he referenced the breadth of technological change. And I think that you will see and, and, and recognize uh, that the technological changes that have happened in hunting are just as broad as they are in other aspects of our lives and aren't restricted to cell phone game cameras. They involve regular game cameras. They involve rhinos and, and uh, other types of electronic communication. Uh, they involve the GPS tracking uh, for dog hunting. There, there are many aspects of technological advances that have impacted hunting. And so I would suggest, re request uh, that the board deny the petition, uh, both because there's no biological uh, imperative to do otherwise, and also because I think this is a much broader conversation about the ethics of using a wide variety of technological advances in pursuit of game. Uh, and I don't think that it, cell phone uh, live action game cameras uh, are unique uh, or have a, have a outsized impact uh, on, on, uh, on any of these. So I, I guess with that, I, I request uh, any discussion or questions from the board. I'm happy to have questions directed to other members of the department, uh, of course, as well. Um, but I, I, I do not think it, that there is a fundamental difference between uh, use of cell phone game cameras and the use of uh, other types of electronic advances, particularly communications, uh, when people track deer, uh, if there are two or more people tracking deer and they are enabled to be in communication with each other uh, via radio or via rhino, uh, I think that is, is just as significant an advantage, if not a greater advantage, than a live action game camera. And I don't think that this uh, petition should be approved singling out one aspect of a, a wide variety of technological change that we've, that we've seen. So happy to answer any questions. I'm sure that the, either law enforcement, uh, members of the law enforcement division or members of the biological staff who are here would be happy to give you their opinions and their perspectives on it as well. Board members? Yeah, Brian. Uh, I was curious. I, I'm not sure who to direct this question to. Bob, maybe the colonel, you, is there any cases whatsoever of anybody actually looking on a cell phone, hey, there's a deer, I'm gonna go kill it. I mean, it's absurd to me to think that it may give you a little bit of an advantage, but you still get relative to wherever your camera is. And I can't believe that it's happening. I know, I know a lot of people that have these cameras. And the biggest use for them is, hey, look at that. They got a nice picture on their phone. They saved the picture. I, 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 I don't know if a single person has actually used it to their advantage to, to all of a sudden see that there's a deer or a bear or whatever in their food plot and run out there and shoot it. I mean, it just, I've never heard of that being done. Mr. Bailey, we have, we have um, confirmation of one animal, and, and the wardens, feel free to speak if you know of any more, but there was, and the only reason we know about it is because it was in the newspaper uh, in the Addison Independent last year where a gentleman who was at work had a, had a deer pop up and asked his boss if he could leave and he went and shot it. I was very suspicious there was something keeping that deer there that was not legal. Um, we weren't able to prove that. Um, not, I'm not sure how far the investigation went, but I made it known when I wanted to look into it. Um, 
but without some sort of ability to hold that wildlife there, I mean, you're you're setting up on a on a trail, you know, in a in a, in a, in a deer's or bear's home range and hoping to get a picture of it. I agree with you 100%. It's, it's very unlikely that you're going to have any success. This this guy was an anomaly and the only one that I've heard of, but the wardens can feel great to speak of others. Have a hard time visualizing that happen, or at least to the extent of what this gentleman was saying. Mm -hmm. talking about ethics. And, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure it's possible. I'm sure it's happened in the rare occasion. I'm also equally sure that somebody has radioed their hunting partner and told them, I'm by this mountaintop and he's coming towards you. Yeah. Um, and and uh, you know I, I I don't see this as particularly unique among the among the different uh, uh, changes that have happened in technology. I mean, without even getting into other aspects of technology beyond electronics. Right. And, uh, if that were to happen and happen often, I guess I could. I mean, I have a different opinion on Just all the people that I know. I just wanted to get on record the uh, exact language with BNC uh, as it was quoted from the petitioner. And I did speak to Justice Spring. Justice Spring is the director of the Big Team Management Records for the Wooden Pocket. I did speak to him. Uh, he is from Missoula, Montana. And he sent me the exact language. And it's now quoted it. it's trail camera usage, the use of any technology that delivers real time location data, including photos, to target or guide a hunter to any species or animal in a manner that elicits an immediate real-time response by the hunter is not permitted. And it's not permitted for an entry into their records. And in speaking with Justin, um, they are the beans, he, he sits on the board and some of their statements that they put out, he's part of that. And they are not against cell phone cameras at all. What they are, a, uh, they walk a fine line of keeping uh, technology not too invasive on it is a fine line because it is a constant involved um, animal, if you want. Um, so many other examples that were mentioned were the um, GPS collars, for example. They don't uh, ban or don't allow the GPS collars on paint our dogs for like mountain lion or bear, just not at the time of release. But if you want to turn them on after the fact and then collect your dogs after the after the hunt, to find them. Then. So that's where their stance is. But they don't they're not out advocating for the ban and state laws to actually prohibit them. Uh, in regards to Arizona, I mentioned it briefly uh, earlier to the petitioner. Arizona banned them because they're dealing with water table issues on public lands. It's really, it's uh, concentrating the animals. And the fish and wildlife uh, were concerned on uh, their ability to manage the wildlife. So Ruben Crockett did make a statement that they did support the ban on that, those cameras in that state, only because it was having a management effect. And that is their stance. If any technology, it doesn't just have to be cameras, if it's having an effect on the management of a game animal, uh, they do stay behind uh, the banning of that technology, whatever, whatever it may be. Um, but anyway, that's their stance. That's the official language. I just want to know the record, but that is where they're at. Um, and that came directly from the private my, my question to the position is because he stated that, uh, that New Mexico had banned them on public lands. My question is going to be about private lands and how much public land versus private land is in New Mexico. Um, so you won't get no response. There's a lot of public land in New yeah. Mexico. And, and then you, you probably don't know the answer to ban on public land. When private land or is just ban on public land or can you use a camera on your own land? Or? As far as I know, it's public land. That's what I read. Actually, I think when you mentioned that it's bad traffic, public. Yeah. And what Dave said here, he said that Pope Young and Wooden Crockett had a quote here, said under 
the unwritten rules always govern the actions of the ethical hunters. So that was, they also said they have some of the red dealers to get Just in terms of discussion, I feel as though we're up the vast resources of our department and the time and attention of this board are being asked by a very small group of people <coughs> to legislate their morals. And I don't think that's our job. I think our job is to uh, provide fish and wildlife for the enjoyment of all. And I, I feel a little resentful of it. I, I uh, you know, I, I get that entirely, and uh, I get the frustration. I will say that I think in and amongst these petitions, there were some questions that we should answer. And uh, I would say there were many, uh, there were other, also ones that I, that I didn't think were necessary to answer, but there were some that I think were, were worthy of an answer. Um, and, and you saw the answer from the biologists on those. So I would say it's a mixed bag from my perspective, speaking only, only for myself. But, yeah. But will they get the answers? Well, they, they ask the question, they put the petition out, they ask the question, well, how will they get the answers? Well, they, they got the answers. <laughs> the, the, the answers were offered, which is yeah. the extent of what we can do. Yeah. Great. You also offered to work with them? <laughs> uh, any further discussion? Any motion? I will make a motion to. Uh, not support this petition. Second. Randy number two. Jay number one. Further discussion on that? I think that's about to say something. No. Okay. okay. Oh, not hearing anything, we're going to go through this. So, a yes would be to deny this uh, the petition to ban live action trail cameras. Uh, Brian Bain? Yes. Mike Bancroft? Yes. I'm a yes. Wendy Butler? Yes. Mike Colson? Yes. Brian McCarthy? Yes. Dave Robillard? Yes. Jay Sweeney? Yes. Marty Van Buren? Yes. Bill Pickens? Oh, yes. Okay. Also, it was not passed. <laughs> uh, before we move on, Commissioner, many thanks again to everybody involved. It was obviously a big effort, so. Very appreciative, and as I always say, when discussion is short, that's usually because it was a pretty definitive response. So, appreciate that very much. And, and your efforts were not wasted because I learned a lot. Great. Almost wish we got decision for so it could move Thanks for that. Commissioner. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, brief update for us. Uh, Moose permit uh, deadline is June 30th, and uh, we're planning a drawing in August. Um, sort of an internal uh, note here that, that uh, the Fish and Wildlife Department is, is, has a, a large number of vacancies right now, and crucial vacancies. So to the extent that that interferes in, in your uh, ability to get responses from us, answers from us, in the public's ability to get answers and responses to us, I, I apologize, we're working as quickly as we can to fill them, but we have a number of crucial vacancies, including two of the three program director, uh, directors in the program managers in the wildlife division. So Steve Perrin uh, and Adam Miller, Adam went to Department of Environmental Conservation, uh, Steve Perrin retired. So two of the three, two, two of, of Mark's three lieutenants are, are vacant right now. Um, in addition, there's a, uh, several other important vacancies in the wildlife division. Uh, and a couple in education outreach, a couple in the warden force. So we're we're uh, we're a little bit shorthanded right now, but but working on filling those. And of course, we have a you know a pretty extensive and and I think responsible but pretty exhaustive hiring process in the state government and particularly in the department. So that actually takes a lot more staff to engage in a commit on hiring committees uh, to to replace those positions. So I just wanted to mention that. Uh, speaking of vacancies. Two, uh, two, uh, well, one change in one vacancy, which I'm, both of which I'm, I'm sorry to see, uh, but also congratulate both of them. Uh, Forrest Hammond, uh, Frosty is done uh, this summer, uh, retiring, and uh, to say he will be difficult to replace would be a, a vast understatement. He will be impossible to replace. 
Uh, the Bear Project has been the great beneficiary of his work. Uh, all of us as his colleagues have been the beneficiary of that, and this board's been the beneficiary of his expertise and his dedication. Um, and uh, now we'll have to handle uh, 10,000 uh, nuisance bear complaints as a private citizen. <laughs> but c congratulations to, to Frost. Do you want to say anything, Frost? I don't want to put you on the spot, but do it. <laughs> um, just how much I've, I've uh, enjoyed working for the department and very been proud to, including been involved with the board the time I've come before the board, I've been impressed. Uh, with a lot of the people there and, and a lot of the folks that become friends through the years and working with that as well. And so it's bittersweet leaving, but I'm looking forward to other chapters and there's a lot of things I want to do. So congratulations. 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 Add anything Mark or are you good? Oh man, you can't, this guy's not going to be the place of man. No, he's not. I, I'm sweating bullets right now. The others, we can fill in for other people, including myself, Matt Frost. <laughs> well, uh, Frost will be greatly missed as a, as a friend and a colleague and, and uh, as a leader of the Bear Project, but we're excited for him. Uh, so the other change is Will Duane, who's been uh, my assistant for four, three, three, three years now, uh, is going to go and replace Jane Lazorczyk as the head of our acquisitions, land acquisitions effort. And so that'll be a new and exciting uh, uh, learning curve for Will. I, I, I literally cannot do anything without his help, so that'll be a bit of a challenge. I uh, hope all of you bear with me. But uh, Will, do you want to say anything? Uh, just that it's been a pleasure getting to know all of you and understand the, the interplay between the important work that you do and how we support you here at the department. Um, looking really forward to getting out into the state more and perhaps as I come through your various counties I'm going to look some people up and maybe step into a stream or two. Absolutely. So it's been a pleasure working with all of you and uh, I'll be available for sure going forward. Well, I am on that way before they post it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, last I just wanted to give my very very uh, heartfelt and sincere thanks to Kim and to Katie and to Chris and to uh, Lieutenant Fowler and to all the others on the FUR team for preparing the responses to these petitions. Uh, I, our, our, our folks in the department take their jobs and take their trust very seriously. I think you can see that in the very significant effort uh, that went into those responses. And, uh, and uh, so I just wanted to say, you know, I, I am, even after seven years, I'm continually impressed with their science and their dedication. So thanks. Appreciate it, you guys. Sure. Thank you for all that tonight. It was everybody. nothing. <laughs> <laughs> nothing. Nothing a few dozen hours for half a dozen people can't do. Yeah, yeah. Um, I kind of have to think about that. <laughs> Thank you. Serve the pizza till after the rest of the presentation. Right. 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 <laughs> and that's it for me, Mr. Chair. Thank, thank you. you. Let's go around the board. Dave. Uh, I just want to thank uh, Kim. Uh, you know, I'm not a. I've been on the board maybe three years, I think, and I'm not a trapper. But every time you're called to task, I learn a lot. And uh, I don't know when you're due to retire, but I'm pretty sure it's going to be denied. So <laughs> I'm sure if you're around a long time. Uh, I just want to thank you. It's, it's, uh, I enjoy wildlife, and again, I don't trap, but I, I learn a lot about this, some species that I don't really target. Um, and uh, it's just it's great. It's like a, it's a great class to be a part of, and I'm, I'm, it's, you make it you make it uh, learning uh, fantastic. Yeah. As far as the math goes, yeah, you're over my head a little bit. Okay, <laughs> I'm not doc, but uh, it's great because it's, it's clear you know your stuff, and it's just you know, it's. it's yeah, it's, it's too bad that you guys uh, feel like you're undermined. You just know that the rest of us, you know, we, there's a lot of uh, the public that really do a lot of trust in it. And uh, we, we do a great show today. Thank you. Uh, and that's about it. I uh, did well. I was successful during the first season. Uh, that was uh, a lot of fun, as it was. And uh, now it's it's summer project. So, uh, that's a good thing. Thank you. Marty, I won't skip you this time. Okay. <laughs> Um, it was good to see Dustin, he's the board that used to be down in our area. Lauren and I met the uh, guy that comes up, Justin Turner. He was good to see him, the new board. He came to the shop, he had a good visit for about half an hour. 
uh, yet through turkey season, my wife and I did, and uh, we're seeing less land on two down our way right now with all the acquisition, and that's kind of the talk a little bit. Mm -hmm. The guys are a little worried. Uh, and again, great presentation. I learned a lot, and I like the science, not emotion. Thank you. Bill, good to have you. Yeah. Good evening. <laughs> Got anything for us? I might get a haircut. <laughs> it feels good. I just did that. Uh, I just want Kim and the rest of the staff over there to know. I know you get hammered by the Wildlife Coalition and POW and their disrespect for what you do. But you need to know that the sportsmen that I talk to have full respect for what you do and what you say. And it's, for those of you that were around during the no wars, just remember, back then everybody that carried a gun was an expert on deer. <laughs> These people come into this state because they like it, and they get here and find out what we do and they can't stand it anymore, and they just started forcing on us and forcing down everybody else's throat. And as long as you're standing up here giving us the truth and the actual numbers, that won't happen. Thank you. Sure. Wendy. Yeah, I, I don't really have anything just to say thank you to you. Um, and. Um, preparing this. Uh, I always learn a lot and I'm always inspired by what I what I learned here and encouraged and I think that when you look at the survey that was done, was it 2015, where the um, approval, you know, this is a small number of people who are being very, very loud, but the approval is uh, is there among the Vermonters for what we do. And so we just have to remember that and keep going. Thank you. <laughs> I just want to say what an honor is to, to even be in the same room with all you guys. You're a hell of a team. And we all respect you dramatically. Right? We talk about it all the time. We're not. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for, for doing what you do and supporting what we're trying to do. Katie and Kim, good job. I'm Fifteen minutes past my bedtime. So. <laughs> um, I echo everybody's sentiments about the presentation tonight. Uh, it was fantastic. I love it all. Uh, these petitions, that nah. I don't even know how to say what I want to say. It'd be I guess, but, um, it, it starts with this. The gentleman from uh, the Wildlife Coalition said he didn't have any intention of banning hunting. Or I, I don't believe it. I think their ultimate goal is to ban the taking of wildlife altogether. And, and, and if we give an inch, I'll only say anything. Are they going to stop coming to us with their petitions? Are they going to come back? What's the, what's the next one? I just, I think it's, I think this is just the beginning. I think they're going to keep back for us. And uh, one of those petitions that was brought to us, uh, if they can't get to us, can't change things through the department and the board, they're going to start legislating change because they're getting more and more support here in Montpelier for the their beliefs. And I don't know how to combat that. I mean, we have to stay, get as many people involved as we possibly can, make our voices heard, and our feelings known. Mike Covey, you do a beautiful job at it. And, uh, we have to be vigilant and make sure we get as many people involved and active. And we deal with this a lot to play the fishing game club. Just, it's not going to go away anytime soon. We have to stay active. I also want to say it's often nice to get together here and see if we get a question. Mm -hmm. I, I, 
not much of a computer person, so most of you probably know. I hate him, and I, I this is much, much better. Good to see you all. Thank you. Okay. Um, I can see when these groups come in and approach us, they're passionate about what they believe in. And, and I, I can commend them for that because they're passionate about wildlife. Uh, when you're that compassionate about some things, though, sometimes you can take information and form it to, to support your belief, even though the information isn't really accurate. And, and I think when we continue to do these presentations like you guys did tonight, and, and we'll continue to have to do, uh, we just reinforce the fact that, you know, we understand your position, but, but your basis is wrong, and, and we want to try to educate you, and, and that's why I'm disappointed they left, but maybe they got educated enough to realize that their, their ideals were flawed or whatever. I don't think that changes their passion for their belief, and that's fine. Um, as long as we walk out here tonight, and I will, knowing that, that we made decisions tonight based on information that we know is sound and solid. And we know we'll have to change as time goes on because the world's changing. And with the work you guys do every day and keeping up with what's going on today, not, you know, it's important what happened 50 years ago, but what's happening today is, is as important, if not more, and I trust that you guys are doing that, and, and I commend you for your presentation tonight and work that you do every day. Thank you. Okay. Mike? Ditto. I can you that time, too. No, it's not that long. That's my big time. But uh, to all of you, thank you. I, I signed up right after you got done, Katie, for a for a math class. I mean, I've never seen <laughs> such a boring subject covered so professionally. I mean, you just you brought the house down. And so, thank you. I have a whole new appreciation. Ken, the way you guys formulated that was just perfect. And if we could stay that course, I think we'll keep our heads above water. Thank we'll you. Take care of everyone if you have kids with the hats. It's a real bummer. <laughs> Tell us more. Yeah. Very good. All right. Yeah, thanks again, everybody. Uh, thank you all. I, I am disappointed that petitioners left. I think the petitioning process is an extremely important part of what we do. And when petitions are not worked on together, uh, there's usually a disappointing outcome for the petitioner. And uh, hands have been outstretched many times, I think, to work together, and, and they, they don't. Um, anyway, that's all I say on that. Uh, Frost, congratulations on your retirement. Our bear trip to the mountains was one of my favorite memories, probably, of my time on this board. I will say I thought I was going to see some bear cubs, and when everybody started talking about a bear named Tony, we were going to see. I thought I either needed to go back to the birds and the bees class, or we were going to do something different than what I was thinking. But either way, Tony was a very fun bear to see, and that was a, that was a highlight of my time, a major highlight. So I appreciate that, allowing me to tag along that day. It's great. It's, it's, uh, it's actually still my, my background picture on my Facebook page, really. And the amount of people that have made false assumptions on me that in that picture thinking I'm there with a harvested bear, because, you know, of course, that's what we do. And all we do is kill things. Uh, only to find out that we were actually checking in on the bear to see how healthy he was. Well, you uh, kill your share, too. Not of bears. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I won't go into any more detail on that. Uh, that's it. The only, well, I'll close with this. The only harvest I had made this year was a tick I killed this morning with a titanium hammer. <laughs> and so it felt really, really good. Felt really good. So thanks again to the department. Uh, wonderful evening. Uh, an hour ahead of when I thought we were going to be done, so testament to you all. Thank you very much. Is there a motion to adjourn? I will make that motion. Jay, second. I second. Okay. Thank you.